Truth is something that exists in reality and corresponds to the real state of affairs, but sometimes it is difficult to accept the truth, and a person creates a lie, which sincerely begins to believe and convince others. Eleven young men and one girl met in a hotel room to celebrate the new year. Strange collaboration, you will think, and you will be right. But wait. There is one fact that will completely change your opinion. The men at this party are all members of a sexual minority, which means that 12 friends just met to have fun and celebrate the year 2021. And indeed, they celebrated the new year very cheerfully, so much so that on January 1st, the company had to take the only girl to the hospital, where doctors declared her death. But who was she? How did she die and was anyone charged in connection with her death? But that's all in order. Next, let's break down the past party almost minute by minute. See what happened on the fateful night and you'll definitely understand why we started this story with the notion of truth. So on December 31st, 2020 in Manila, the capital of the Philippines at the four-star City Garden Grand Hotel, John Paul de Lacerne checked in at 11 a.m. Christine de Serra checked in later and during the day, nine other guys checked into room 2207 and room 2209 which were on the same floor. Hotel manager John Paul Kalili joined the Mary Company just after midnight. New Year's Eve night was all about fun, dancing and alcohol, lots of alcohol. Rommel Galita woke up around 10 a.m. and noticed Christine sleeping in the bathtub. He covered her with a blanket and went back to sleep. When he woke up several hours later, he found her unconscious and beginning to turn blue. Christine was taken to the hospital by three friends and hotel staff, but upon arrival at the emergency room, doctors only pronounced her dead. The eleven guys with the only girl spent the entire night in the hotel room, and she was dead by morning. News headlines about the crime shocked the public. Everyone imagined the story the same way, because it was obvious what a group of young guys and one girl could do all night. But what really happened that New Year's Eve night and from what Christine Dassera died was to be solved by the investigation. Christine Angelica Dassera was born on April 13, 1997, into the well-to-do family of John Nestor Dassera and Sharon Rose Faba Dassera, and grew up in Barangay San Isidro, General Santos City. She grew up an outgoing, intelligent, and independent girl. Kristen was a loving sister to her three siblings, Monica, Chloe, and JJ. After graduating from high school, she moved to the larger and more promising city of Davao, on the shores of the bay of the same name. There she enrolled in university. Christine studied diligently, danced, modeled, and was active on social media. Christine was also the epitome of beauty and intelligence. In 2017, she graduated with honors from the University of the Philippines Mindanao in Davao City where she earned a Bachelor of Arts in Communication Arts with a major in Media Arts. The girl has been actively involved in modeling and theatrical performances. On August 5, 2017, she competed against eight other contenders for the title of Miss Silva Davao 2017 at the New City Commercial Corporation Mall in Davao City. She came in second place. In June 2018, she participated in the annual fashion show. From September 2017 to January 2019, she worked as a marketing consultant for Gaisano Malls in different parts of Mindanao including Davao City, General Santos City, Tagum, Toril, and Digos. Christine's life has been colorful and fulfilling. In February 2019, her life's dream came true. She moved to Manila to start working as a flight attendant for PAL Express, a subsidiary of Philippine Airlines. Christine Dessera's last flight as a flight attendant was on December 28, 2020. Christine's death was immediately publicized, due to which numerous discussions and theories were formed in the community. Initially, the police suspected that Kristen was most likely abused and killed by a group of guys she was partying with on New Year's Eve. Even without autopsy results and a toxicology report, Makati City Police filed preliminary charges of assault and murder against 11 men. The Philippine National Police declared the case closed. Arrests were made with charges and identification of suspects. 
Three of the party participants were detained after surrendering to authorities on their own. But the main answer to what really caused Christine's death was the forensic medical report. The autopsy of Christine's body was conducted in Passe City at the Rizal Funeral Home under the direction of Forensic Medical Officer Police Major Michael Nick Sartiento. On January 3, 2021, the examination of Christine Dasser's body was completed and a forensic report was issued which found that death was due to natural causes due to a ruptured aortic aneurysm. However, it also mentioned bruises on the girl's right arm, right thigh, knees, ankles, and right foot, as well as a linear abrasion on her right thigh. Deeply healed lacerations and abrasions were also reported during the genital exam. The National Capital Region Police Department announced that a special investigation team had been set up to look into the case, but Christine's family was unwilling to accept the fact that a young, vibrant girl could die a natural death prematurely. At a press conference on January 5th, 2021, Christine Dasser's family stated that they had seen the autopsy report that said she died of an aneurysm. However, they stated that the autopsy performed was incomplete and requested a second autopsy. The parents of the deceased have been trying to understand how Christine's aorta was ruptured. After all, the police and the Dasera family lawyer believed that the aneurysm was the result of assault or abuse which means it was not a natural death and the perpetrators should be punished. The prosecutor's office identified all of the 11 men who were with Christine throughout the night. Some of them were her co-workers. Other young men were friends of her friends whom Christine was meeting for the first time. It turned out that Christine was the initiator of this party. She had booked the hotel room herself a few days in advance and coordinated this party with her friends. Her mom, Sharon, was aware of her daughter's friendship with men and never opposed it. Since childhood, Kristen had found it easier to socialize and make friends with the male gender, so it was considered normal in their family. In addition, she and her friends usually did not go home for vacations, so it became a tradition for them to meet each other every year. Kristen was able to call her family just after midnight to inform them of the ongoing celebration at the Makati Hotel and to wish her family a happy new year. During the video call, the family could see Kristen's friends and the surrounding festive environment. However, there has been new speculation about the abuse allegation. So in the case, the main evidence of the incident became the frames of the video from the hotel lobby, the study of which helped the police almost minute by minute to reconstruct the picture of what happened. It should be noted that the party was to be held in room 2209. It was this room and booked Christine Dacra. The main events begin to unfold in the late afternoon. At 11.21 p.m., Christine leaves room 2209 and goes to room 2207. At 11.38 p.m., the company returns to their room. Christine goes last. She is holding her shoes in a glass. At 2.50 a.m., Christine holding the hand of a new acquaintance, Valentine, goes to room 2207. While they are at a neighbor's house, a hotel employee brings an extra mattress to room 2209. At 2.52 a.m., Valentin accompanies Christine to her room. Valentine's gait shows that the girl is already quite drunk. Her gait is too relaxed, and she is holding a bottle in her hand. The friends stop at the door, and Christine suddenly kisses Valentine, but the man quickly pulls away, after which the couple goes inside. At 3.15 a.m., Christine hurriedly leaves her room and goes to her neighbor's room, and six minutes later, one of the guys leaves there. He heads to room 2209, presumably to call his friends. At 3.22 a.m., Christine de Sarah can be seen chatting with another man in the next room on the right side of the hallway, while two other men walk past them. She looked upset. Suddenly, Christine hugs one of her friends, and then they disappear from the view of the cameras altogether. At 4.13 a.m., John de la Cerne can be seen carrying Christine back to the first room. At 4.22 a.m., the camera again captures Christine at the door of room 2207. It's unclear what brought her there again. She practically falls off her feet, and a guy who looks like John de la Cerne picks her up by the waist and carries her to room 2209. 
Christine looks pretty drunk. At 5.05 a.m., the camera captures Christine laughing as she runs away from a guy who looks like Louis de Lima. Afterward, they're standing outside room 2207. Christine looks normal, and with him she enters room 2209. At 6.23 a.m., Christine makes her last appearance on camera alive. For the last time, Valentin carries her in his arms from room 2207. The girl is conscious. It was obviously an eventful night, but the most important truth still remains behind the scenes. The party continued until dawn. Around 12 noon, when Christine was found unconscious in the bathtub, her friends carried her to the floor and repeatedly attempted cardiopulmonary resuscitation. After unsuccessful attempts, they called for help at the front desk. A few minutes later, the hotel manager and the head of security arrived in the room. They used a wheelchair to lower Christine to the first floor of the hotel. Rommel Galido accompanied Christine to the hospital. The doctors unfortunately only stated the girl's death. Rommel called Christine's mom and broke the bad news. It can be assumed that what is happening really looks like a fun party and definitely to be in one room such a large company was cramped, so young people chaotically moved all night from room to room. But the investigators had suspicions about the use of illegal substances to enhance the effect of alcohol. When questioned, some of the detainees claimed that there were no illegal substances during the party, but only whiskey and tequila. It is worth noting that illegal drugs were initially the centerpiece of the investigation, as the testimony of one of the detainees reported that Christine had doubts about the contents of the drinks and suggested that someone may have spiked it with an unknown substance. It transpired that guests were asked to bring their own food and drinks. Because of this, there was speculation that Christine Dassera's drink was poisoned and could have triggered the aneurysm that eventually led to her death but the autopsy report stated that no alcohol or illegal drugs taken the night before her death would cause this type of aortic dilatation or defect. Substance information was later unconfirmed, as no illegal substances or traces of them were found in the room or in the suspect's personal belongings. An examination and search of the two rooms, as well as the neighboring room 2009, Looking for potential evidence did not yield the desired results that at least indirectly proved the violent death of Christine de Cerna. Under questioning, Mark Rosales and John de la Cerna publicly admitted their unconventional orientation and stated that Christine was their best friend and they would never hurt her. John also revealed that they had to bring Christine back from room 2207 because she was already vomiting early in the morning. Rommel Galido said that around 10 a.m. he found Christine in the bathtub of their room and thought she was asleep, so he just covered her with a blanket. However, around noon after he woke up and went back to wake her up, he realized the girl was blue and not breathing. He rushed to his friends for help. The hotel advised that she be rushed to Makati Medical Center where she was pronounced dead on arrival, reportedly due to a ruptured aortic aneurysm. The hospital reported the death to the Makati City Police. Meanwhile, other men from a neighboring hotel room had left by then. On January 4th, the Philippine National Police sent a separate statement to the media about the Christine Dacer incident, saying that the case is almost solved despite some missing details and conflicting reports on the matter. Police Chief Debold Sinas said they already have three suspects and they have been apprehended. Other suspects were being sought, but as early as January 6th, the Makati City Prosecutor's Office ordered the release of the three men who were in custody due to lack of evidence. Prosecutors insisted that the evidence presented was insufficient to establish that Christine was abused. They also said that even if Christine Dacer was abused, the police have yet to prove that this is what caused her death. Moreover, the party was a gathering of men of non-traditional orientation where they were all flirting with each other, and Christine was an extra woman. Rommel Galido, as well as most of those present at the party were stewards and co-workers of Christine de Serra at PL Airlines, indicating that she was well acquainted with these men and their orientation. On January 13, 2021, the Makati City Prosecutor's Office launched a preliminary investigation 
and based on an official autopsy that confirmed that the 23-year-old died from a ruptured aortic aneurysm. The prosecutor's office also called on the police to release the results of the victim's DNA analysis, toxicology report, and histopathic study. However, Christine's mother, Sharon DeSera, criticized the report that her daughter was not abused. She appeared on a news show where she claimed that her daughter was abused by a group of guys. If you see Christine's body, if you're a mother, you'll probably feel the pain that Christine suffered because of them. But my daughter can't talk anymore because she's dead. The woman spoke out on the TV program. Sharon cited the lacerations and bruises on her daughter's body, which were not recorded in the autopsy, as evidence that the report was inaccurate. Christine's family later said they wanted another autopsy to challenge authorities' initial findings that she died a natural death. The basis was injuries and bruising that were not documented in the first report. Family spokesperson Brick Reyes said that the injuries on the victim's legs and arms, as well as her remains, would provide sufficient evidence that Christine was abused. Rick Reyes also said that they believed the young woman was drugged and abused before she died. Christine was already intoxicated and complained that something seemed to have been spiked in her drink during the New Year's Eve celebration. Christine's parents said they have filed a complaint demanding the immediate dismissal of Michael Nick Sarmiento for gross negligence and gross incompetence in preparing Christine's forensic report and death certificate. Dr. Marisi Ramos, a friend of Dasser's family, told reporters that the body was subjected to a second autopsy. He also emphasized that the biological fluids recovered from the second autopsy had been forwarded to the Death Investigation Unit, which will provide more details after a final evaluation and consolidation of all the findings of its forensic team. The pathology autopsy results from the Southern Police District Crime Lab Division's forensic report, which was eventually shared on social media, showed that the cause of death was consistent with what was previously reported as a ruptured aortic aneurysm. The official autopsy revealed that Christina was not abused on the night of her death. The actual cause of Dasera's death lies in the aorta. The constant increase in blood pressure in the aorta caused the defect to weaken, and eventually the aorta ruptured, the Philippine National Police Crime Lab report said. At the time the aorta rupture occurred, there was blood loss, so Christine felt various symptoms such as weakness, nausea, and sweating. The blood loss due to the aortic rupture killed her within a few hours, the report said. This means that the girl had a ruptured aortic aneurysm, which enlarged the lower part of the main vessel, aorta, that supplies blood to the entire body. This vessel runs from a person's heart through the chest and abdomen. Since the aorta is the largest vessel in the body, if it ruptures, a person can lose a huge amount of blood and potentially be fatal, as in this case. In addition, it was noted that Christine's aneurysm did not occur recently. It started a long time ago. The report states that dilatation is a chronic condition and was present long before her death. Had she not died that fateful night, she would still have died in any scenario that would cause her blood pressure to rise enough to rupture the aneurysm. The autopsy also revealed that Dasera's heart was enlarged compared to a healthy heart, further confirming Christina Dasera's undiagnosed hypertension. For the most part, it can be confirmed that the girl's death was due to natural causes. But the widespread misinformation brought shame and persecution to those 11 young guys who were at the party and sincerely tried to give Christine first aid, but they were labeled as criminals. All 11 guys who were charged preliminarily have since been released from custody. The Makati City Prosecutor's Office tried to rectify the situation and said that at the time of the publicity, the evidence presented was not enough to establish that Christine DeSera was abused, and it was impossible to obtain proper evidence at that time. Therefore, they had to build a version based on signs of deterioration of the victim's body. In addition, two other suspects said that the police forced them to give false testimony that there were illegal drugs at the New Year's Eve party. Another participant in the story explained his kiss with Christine, which was captured by surveillance cameras on the eve of her death. According to the man, it was Christine herself who initiated it. 
He, however, tried to push her away. Law enforcement officials were criticized for not conducting a thorough toxicological examination when the flight attendant's body was found. The charges against the men were later dropped due to lack of evidence. The death of Christine de Serra attracted widespread media attention as a result of suspicious circumstances that seemed to contradict the findings of the Philippine National Police. Christine's case continued to receive a lot of publicity online as further developments came from her family, who in no way could accept the truth and believe in the natural death of their daughter. The girl's mother, Sharon, appealed to President Rodrigo Duterte for help in seeking justice for her daughter. I am an ordinary person. You also have a daughter. I want to speak out openly because I don't want anyone to be victimized by the kind of cruelty and barbarism like my Christine. Christine Dacara was buried at Forest Lake Memorial Park in her hometown of General Santos more than a week after her death. A wave of condolences, reposts, and farewells traveled across the social stanzas of Kristen's friends and co-workers. Ultimately, the unconventional case of Kristen Dasera serves as a prime example of when the media spreads misinformation and how it can affect the public as well as impact those involved. As we come to the end, the story wants to return to the truth, which sooner or later, but in any form, is bound to take its place of honor. After all, the truth is one. But Christine's family is still convinced that the girl was killed by these people and that there is something secret in this story. Personally, I do not understand and found no answers to the question about bruises and wounds on Christine's body. Why was it hushed up? It seems that despite the presence of wounds and bruises on Christine's body, the cause of her death was not them, but the rupture of the aorta due to heart disease so they did not focus on the wounds on her body. In my opinion, there are a lot of oddities and inconsistencies in this case, but you guys are the judge. I would like to wish Christine's family to accept the irreparable loss, because young guys, whether they are guilty or not, will end up remembering the same sad story every New Year's Eve and making excuses for the rest of their lives. A woman's corpse was found five miles outside of Wayland, Massachusetts, in the early morning hours of July 4, 2011. The find was discovered by a woman riding a bicycle whose path took her near a swampy area. While riding, she was admiring the scenery. Suddenly, her attention was drawn to something fanciful and out of place. When curiosity got the better of her, the woman came closer and was horrified. Not far from the road, a dead girl lay among the grass and mud. To all appearances, the poor girl had not drowned, but had encountered unprecedented cruelty. A wound was visible on her neck, and a bungee cord was tangled in her hair. Coping with her excitement, the bystander dialed emergency services and reported what she had seen. Suddenly, her plans for the day changed. She put aside her business and waited for the police. Upon arriving on the scene, law enforcement officers pulled the body onto dry land and examined it after which it was immediately sent for forensic examination. The girl had been in the water for a short time, so her appearance had not undergone significant changes. Officers recognized 18-year-old Lauren Astley, universally wanted since the previous evening. Lauren had been reported missing the previous day after she failed to return home or turn up for a meeting with friends. CCTV cameras recorded her entering the shopping center where she worked as a sales clerk at around 10 a.m. on July 3rd and leaving the building at 6.45 p.m. after finishing her shift. It was established that Astley was on the phone with someone at this time. Unfortunately, that was the last time she was seen alive. She was never heard from after that. Malcolm, the heroine's father, began to worry. After all, his daughter was characterized by punctuality and was true to her word. Therefore, if she had said she would be home by the appointed time, she would do so. She would not change her route for no apparent reason. At most, she would have reported that she was running late. Mr. Astley therefore realized that something bad had happened and without wasting time, reported the disappearance to the police. The police officers did not wait for the allotted time and started the search immediately. In parallel, the girl's family and friends joined in. By the way, Word of mouth worked quickly, and the news that she was missing instantly spread among acquaintances. Soon in the parking lot of the local beach was found a red jeep, the car of the missing. 
The car stood with the windows down, and her personal belongings, a purse and a laptop, lay inside the car. However, the girl herself was not in it. It was also unclear where she could have gone after leaving the vehicle so precariously. When Malcolm was informed of the discovery of the car, he immediately drove to the spot. There he tried to figure out where his daughter had gone. He walked along the shore and shone a flashlight into the water, looking for her as if she had drowned. Lauren's friends arrived after him. They decided to spend the night at the site, hoping to be the first to spot her. All night they scoured the area and wondered where Lauren had disappeared to. The young men didn't know what to think or where to look for her. However, none of them could imagine that something irreparable had happened to Lauren. It seemed like something that only happened in the movies. The person you had been talking and laughing with not so long ago couldn't just disappear like that. Not twelve hours later, Lauren's body was found. The first person the officers called was her father. They informed about the terrible discovery and asked to come to the identification. Malcolm's eyes to the last refused to believe that the girl lying on the pathologist's table, his daughter. However, coming to his senses, the man officially recognized his child. In front of him lay his girl, young and bright, who recently had her whole life ahead of her. Unbearable pain pierced the man's heart. Nevertheless, nothing could be brought back or undone. At this point, he had to do two important things, to report the terrible news to his former spouse and find the culprit in the death of his daughter. When the sad news spread throughout the city, no one could not believe what had happened. Family and close acquaintances in one voice said that Lauren had no enemies or ill-wishers. The only one on whom suspicion involuntarily fell was her ex-boyfriend, Nathaniel Fujita. His name was spoken with great hesitation, as everyone knew how much he loved Lauren and would never hurt her. However, the deformations that happen to a person who has gone through a breakup are different, and who knows what someone who is unable to let go of the past is capable of. First love. First love is a very strong feeling. Coming into a person's life, it changes it completely, ruins the usual way of life. Such emotions nourish and inspire, dilute reality with new colors. Together with it comes the first kiss, the first intimate experience, the first departure from the parental home, the first job, and so on. This is a very vivid segment of life when some sensations are superimposed on others. But often such love is fleeting. Someone breaks up because they are separated by circumstances, someone could not cope with the resulting contradictions, and someone simply realized that they do not fit each other. After that, there remains a certain incompleteness and understatement, which excites until the end of days. One way or another, but most of us go through it. However, not everyone has the fortitude to get over it and move on, to thank the person for the time spent and say goodbye to them. This story is about the flip side of love, the heavy addiction and jealousy that ruined young hearts. Lauren Astley and Nathaniel Fujita are the envy of the entire high school. She is a petite, pretty brown girl who stands out from everyone with her activity and uniqueness. He is a tall, ambitious soccer player, the object of adoration of many girls. Despite the fact that young people were acquainted from an early age, they revealed themselves to each other later. Their relationship began in high school and lasted three years. It was a very colorful romance with all the consequences. They fought and made up. They would break up and get back together. Both had a difficult character, but the lovers tried to cherish the fragile feeling that arose between them. This continued, at least for the first few years of their relationship. Lauren Dunn Astley was born in 1993 in Boston. She was the only child in the family of Mary and Malcolm. From this, their attention was completely focused on the little girl. Since both parents worked as teachers, important values were instilled in her from an early age. Their most important wish was for their daughter to grow up to be a good person. When Lauren was six years old, the couple Astley divorced. However, this did not affect the upbringing of the girl. Each of them still continued to care about her and support Lauren in all endeavors, and they have a young beauty was a lot. She was constantly fascinated by something and her whole day was scheduled by the minute. Her versatile interests were amazing. Lauren was fond of tennis and soccer, sang in a musical group, and was a member of the Youth Symphony Orchestra. She was also a member of her church choir, a counselor at a children's camp, 
and had a starring role in a theater production of Annie at the local arts center. No school or town concert was without her participation. Many were amazed by her irrepressible energy. She was active and omnipresent. The second direction of the girls' hobbies was social activity. Astley participated in many charitable actions. At the age of 12, she helped victims of Hurricane Katrina in New Orleans, Louisiana. Afterward, she visited the area two more times on a similar mission. She had a big and kind heart, open to the world and people. Therefore, she cared for others more than she cared for herself. Everyone around her knew that she could be called upon at any time for help or advice. Nathaniel Fujita went to high school with Lauren. He was an outstanding player on the school soccer team and showed great promise. By the way, he also dreamed of connecting his future life with sports. He was known as a diligent student and the soul of the company. The young man was the eldest son of Beta and Tom Fujita. It can be said that his family was prosperous and quite famous in certain circles. His father was a famous guitarist and professor at Berklee College of Music in Boston. He was different from many and was an unconventional person. Perhaps the romantic relationship between Lauren and Nate just on this ground. One day, the girl interviewed the boyfriend's father for a school assignment. After that, she began to appear in their house more often, and when young people stopped hiding their feelings, their parents began to communicate and go to visit each other. As I said earlier, the first two years of the relationship between the lovers were perfect. They were very attractive young people, and their couple was eye-catching. Nate and Lori did everything together, going out, playing sports, studying, and participating in activities. However, later on from such a close connection became stuffy. The guy did not let the girl go anywhere alone and controlled everywhere. He was jealous of her to every pillar, and often he saw things that were not. Nathaniel wanted to get all her attention and not share it with anyone. This was the reason for the conflicts between them. They became more frequent as the young man began to react more aggressively. But at the same time, no one heard Lauren complain about any physical impact. In general, their relationship became like an emotional seesaw. The state of calm was lost. It didn't suit both of them, but they couldn't go back to their previous easy feelings anymore. Lauren more than once thought about the future, and closer to the end of her schooling decided on her future life. She outlined all the pros and cons of her relationship with Nate on a sheet of paper and clearly realized that it was time to say goodbye. She'd also always disliked the way he acted around her mom. Lauren had unwittingly projected their relationship onto her supposed life with him, and she didn't want that kind of behavior. On top of that, the impending enrollment played a big part. Their life paths were already diverging. Lauren was applying to Alona University in North Carolina, and her boyfriend was invited to Trinity College in Connecticut to play soccer there. Breakup. Lauren announced the fateful decision on April 1st, 2011, on her birthday. She considered it the best timing, as there was still time ahead to come to terms with new realities and start their lives with a clean slate. Everyone had new acquaintances and busyness ahead of them that would help push the sad thoughts away. Nathaniel, however, did not share Lauren's aspirations. He felt a deep sense of loss and loneliness. He was no longer excited about going to college. He stopped practicing and partying. All he did all day was lie on the couch and watch TV. The guy fell into a deep depression that he could no longer control. All around noted that from a formerly active and energetic young man, he turned into a withdrawn and depressed. In addition, Fujita became addicted to alcohol and pot. In this way, he wanted to distract himself from the harsh reality. It was hard for Lauren to see him like that, much less be the cause of it. The girl asked her friends for advice on what to do in such a case and how to help him. But everyone recommended her not to interfere and to give him time to get over this pain on his own. Otherwise, he could regard her participation as a chance that everything could be corrected and returned. Her friend's advice was sound. She shouldn't have shown her face to him, for at the sight of her, his condition worsened. Unfortunately, the girl had become his trigger. Looking a little ahead, in the aftermath, her kindness and desire to help turned against her. After graduation, Astley, along with her friends, organized a big party, which was attended by about 150 people. 
the event was held under a huge dome, where young people danced and had fun. Among the invitees also turned out and the ex-boyfriend of the heroine. At the party, Nathan came quite drunk. Seeing Lauren dancing in the middle of the dance floor, he approached her to talk. But she asked him not to bother her and not to ruin the party. There was no point in having idle conversations. Everything had been said several times before. And secondly, she did not want to communicate with him in such a state. However, the guy kept up with her and asked her to start all over again. With each passing minute, his mood worsened and his aggression manifested itself with greater force. At one point, he became so angry that he stepped aside and hit the pole holding the structure with all his might. In response, the structure staggered and collapsed. The celebration was hopelessly ruined. Everyone expressed displeasure and a desire for Nathan to leave the party. Later, Lauren came to her mother in tears and confessed to her that the former boyfriend does not leave her alone and follows her everywhere. The girl added that at the graduation event, he wouldn't let anyone dance with her and behave disgustingly. He was angry that she was happy without him. Suspect. When the police learned Lauren was missing, the first thing they did was to question everyone she was close to. One way or another, all roads led to Fujita. Only he seemed to have a motive to harm her. However, his entire entourage assured her otherwise. However, officers in the course of their practice had more than once come across cases where crimes were committed by people who were not expected to do so. Nathaniel and his mother met the detectives on the doorstep. During the conversation, the boy looked confused. He seemed impressed by the sudden disappearance of his beloved. He admitted that he had seen her recently, around seven o'clock in the evening. The girl stopped by him in her car, after which they had a nice conversation, and then she drove away. According to the guy, their conversation did not take more than five minutes. In addition, the young man added that at the time of Lauren's disappearance, he was at home and did not go anywhere. True, his alibi was difficult to confirm since he was alone at the time. His mother agreed with her son's words. Mrs. Fujita admitted that she had also seen Nathan's ex-girlfriend that day. She visited her at the mall where the latter worked part-time. The woman was saddened by the changes that had occurred in her son. That's why she asked Lauren to talk to him. The fact is that the parents of the young man had already sought help from a psychiatrist, but his services were ineffective. Their son had lost all interest in life and just existed. Beta hoped Lauren's words would give him strength, or at least a sense of male pride in him so he could move on. The request had put a crimp in Lauren's plans, but the meeting wasn't supposed to take a long time, so no one knew about it. It turned out that the phone conversation recorded by the mall's security cameras had taken place between her and Nathan just after the meeting with his mother. The girl was still continuing to worry about her ex-boyfriend, so she dialed him and arranged to see him. At 7.05 p.m., Astley drove up to Fujita's house and sent a text message with the word here. The information that Nathaniel and Beta provided was certainly valuable information for the police officers. However, it was not clear where Lauren had gone after that and why her car was left open on the beach. The case became clearer in the morning when the body of the poor girl was accidentally found in the swamp. Convinced that the corpse of the girl probably belongs to Lauren Astley, the detectives decided to visit Nathan again. This time, however, he was not at home. They didn't need his presence, though. The officers had a search warrant, needed evidence to confirm the version of the investigation about the involvement of the former lover in the murder. The examination began with the garage. Experienced specialists immediately became clear that something bad had happened in it. Somewhere on the floor were found bloodstains, and on the wall in a prominent place hung several elastic cords, they matched those tangled in the murdered girl's hair. Traces of blood were also found in the house. The doorknob, kitchen floor, kitchen sink, and bathroom sink contained faint splatters. It was obvious that someone had tried to mop them up, but had done so sloppily and apparently in a hurry. A black gym bag was found in the basement. Inside it were wet and muddy tennis shoes. In Nathan's bedroom, in a kind of hiding place, detectives found a pair of bloody shoes, wet, bloody clothes, the mud found on the shoes seemed to match the mud from the swamp where Lauren's body had been located. But the samples found had to be submitted to a lab for an official conclusion. Time later, experts confirmed the detectives' assumptions. 
They also determined that the blood found in Fujita's house belonged to the deceased. Undeniable evidence of Nathan's involvement in the ex-girlfriend's death had been obtained. However, his whereabouts were still unknown. Therefore, soon, the guy was declared wanted. The investigation of the case progressed with inconceivable speed. A few hours later, the suspect was found. All this time, he was staying with a cousin in a neighboring town. Eventually, on the morning of July 5, 2011, Nathaniel was arrested on suspicion of murder. At the time of his arrest, he was aloof and quiet, and offered no resistance. At the same time, he did not cooperate with the investigation during interrogation. He didn't say anything about the crime he was charged with. The detectives had two thoughts about it. Either he could not find an excuse for his behavior, or he was afraid to say too much. So he didn't say a word. Investigator's version. The investigation believed that Lauren Astley visited the ex-boyfriend after meeting with his mother. The girl was worried about him, so she decided to talk to him and cheer him up a little. After that, the two of them proceeded to Fujita's garage. There, a quarrel may have taken place. After which, Nathan attacked her and began to strangle her with a bungee cord. After killing the girl, he drove her red jeep to the beach and threw the car keys into a storm drain. By the way, they were later found. The intruder then returned home, put his lover in his car, and drove her to the swamp. Following this, he tried to hide the traces of the crime. Despite the fact that he had not previously been physically violent towards Lauren, it was obvious to everyone that her boyfriend was periodically unrestrained and capable of aggression. Thus, his motives were unwillingness to come to terms with the breakup and underlying resentment. During a preliminary hearing on August 23, 2011, Nathaniel was charged with first-degree felony assault and battery with a dangerous weapon. When the boyfriend was asked if he would plead guilty to the crimes charged, he barely audibly uttered, No. So it became clear that his lawyers had engaged in foul play, having come up with a certain line of conduct and defense. As a result, the prosecutor filed a motion to keep the defendant in jail without the possibility of bail. The court granted the prosecutor's request. Trial. On February 13, 2013, Fujita appeared in court. Nathaniel's attorney, William Sullivan, pleaded the defendant's insanity. He did not deny that a murder had been committed, however. He stated the following. On the evening of July 3, 2011, due to severe clinical depression, the defendant had a psychopathic attack. At that time, the guy was unable to give an account of his actions, so he attacked the girl. Nathan's friends confirmed the words of the defender in terms of changes in his behavior. They told about the fact that he really changed and stopped appearing in the company. Everyone was struck by the fact that previously he was just sick of soccer and did not miss training even during illness. And after parting with Lauren overnight, he stopped being interested in something that was a huge part of his life. The psychiatrist that Fujita visited also spoke at the court hearing. It was he who diagnosed his patient and suggested medication and therapy. However, Nathaniel refused. At trial, it was suggested that the defendant's mental health problems may have stemmed not only from the painful breakup, but primarily because of the athlete's numerous repetitive head injuries. And the breakup exacerbated the situation and triggered a severe seizure. However, the prosecution was not in agreement with the arguments of the defense attorney. Prosecutor Lisa McGovern said that the defendant was aware of what was happening, acted in a planned and calculated manner, and the crime was committed out of base motives. It was found that the guy constantly stalked the girl and did not give her peace. Even that day, a few hours before the end of her working day, he appeared in the shopping center and watched her, which is confirmed by CCTV footage. And Lauren's situation at his mother's request was an opportunity for Nathan to put his criminal intent into action. Witness testimony corroborated the prosecution's case. Fujita was clearly unrepentant. One eyewitness reported seeing Nathan returning home on the unfortunate evening and music playing in his car. A cousin also gave denunciatory testimony against a relative. She said that on the evening of July 3rd, her brother called her and offered to hang out. But the girl was busy so she refused, to what he got very angry and said that he wanted to distract himself, but apparently it will not work. The next day, when the news of Lauren's death became known, his cousin contacted him again. She asked him if he knew, to which he replied that no one would ever know the truth about her death or where the murder weapon was located. In addition, 
he admitted that he had driven the ex's car to the town beach. Thus, the sister realized that Nathaniel was involved in the incident and persuaded him to turn himself in. It turned out that in 2009, when the young people broke up once again, there was one curious incident. Lauren, together with her friends, went to the disco. There was a guy who did not hide his interest in her. After the breakup, Lauren decided to give a chance to a new admirer, and they even kissed. But Nathan saw this and lunged at his rival with his fists. He threatened to slit the young man's throat if he ever came near Lauren again. So it was clear that Nathan was a jealous man. And when he drank alcohol, he lost his temper and became capable of many things, especially given the nature of the injuries Lauren had sustained as a result of the murder. This event confirmed Fujita's violent rage and also indirectly pointed to him as the culprit. In addition, other heinous circumstances came to light. The body of the deceased was found to have wounds that had been inflicted before her death. Among them, there were clear signs of so-called defensive wounds. The girl had tried to resist. A forensic psychiatrist invited by the prosecution also assessed the defendant's condition. However, unlike the previous one, he stated that at the time of the crime, he was in his right mind and made informed decisions. The fierce struggle between the prosecution and the defense came down to the fact that if Fujita was found insane, his sentence would be significantly reduced. Of course, this did not absolve him of the charges, but it did greatly diminish his guilt. This trial was emotional in every sense. In attendance were relatives on both sides. These men had previously been friends with each other. In this situation, they were each hurting in their own way. Nathaniel's parents cried the whole time. They could not believe what had happened and felt immense guilt for their son. The weight of his actions fell on the shoulders of his loved ones. Mary and Malcolm were heartbroken. They had lost their only daughter prematurely. Lauren was dying in agony at the hands of the man she loved. Specialists concluded that the girl had lived for several minutes after the cord around her throat was tightened and cut. Lauren's mother wanted to understand why this had happened to her daughter and how long it had been planned the verdict, and life afterward. After a three-week trial, on March 7, 2013, Nathaniel Fujita was found guilty on all charges. The jury took one day to reach a final verdict. The 20-year-old was sentenced to life in prison without parole. After the verdict, Lauren's father walked up to Nathan's parents and hugged them. His act showed the strength of the man's character and the depth of his heart. Both families had lost the most precious thing they had, Mary and Malcolm Astley later established the Lauren Dunn Astley Memorial Fund to teach teens about healthy relationships. They believe that the crime Nathaniel committed was preventable. The girl's family has dedicated their future lives to spreading awareness on how to avoid couple violence and get over a breakup. In 2024, the state superior court abolished mandatory life without parole sentences for those under the age of 20 at the time of the offense. Thus. Nathaniel had the opportunity to be free. Is that fair? Considering that he took the life of an innocent girl forever and deprived her parents of happiness and peace, there is an opinion that from love to hate is one step. Obsessive love combined with bouts of jealousy and selfishness sometimes leads to crazy acts. The story of the Fujita and Astley families is a sad example of this. On a vast site 60 miles south of Melbourne lies a landfill. As with any dump on a large plot of land, there are towering piles of domestic waste. Birds circle over the meter-high piles, while a foul smell spreads for miles around. This place is usually devoid of people. However, in May 2004, hundreds of police officers were sifting through the trash. The scene resembled something out of an apocalyptic movie, especially when investigators and police officers donned protective suits against biological hazards and ultra-durable masks to guard against asbestos-ridden dirt. The area was littered with thousands of blue trash bags. Each day of searching was incredibly challenging. They had to check every bag. This lengthy and inevitable process significantly delayed the investigation. After three weeks of searching, the officers were disheartened and had exhausted their moral and physical resources. On the final day, they had one last chance to find the mother and daughter. Narelle Fraser, a young woman working in the missing persons department, had put significant effort into the search from the first day, each time apprehensively beginning the inspection of a new blue bag. 
Around 10 a.m. on another day of searching, an excavator pulled up another batch of bags from the depths of a massive pile of garbage for inspection. Fraser noticed a blue bag stuck at the top of the bucket. As she had done hundreds of times over the past days, she paused the search to conduct a thorough examination of the excavated trash. Climbing up the pile, the woman opened the trash bag, but seeing only a kitchen glove, she signaled to continue the search. But something was off. The investigator's intuition brought her back to the bag, and when she reopened it, she saw something else. What she had mistaken for a kitchen glove was actually a bloated, decomposing human hand. She screamed aloud. She had found them. Today, let us visit the marvelous Australia, specifically Mornington Island, where despite the beauty of the surrounding nature, mild climate, and welcoming atmosphere, a nightmare akin to a horror film occurred. In May 2004, John Sharp appeared on television pleading for help. Holding a photograph, he tearfully implored anyone with information about the disappearance of his wife and daughter to contact the police and assist in their search. As it turned out, Anna Sharp and her 18-month-old daughter Gracie had been missing from their home since March. Let's start from the beginning and figure out who is involved in the disappearance of Anna and Gracie Sharp. We'll learn where the mother and daughter went and whether John Sharp could have really harmed his own family or if someone else is to blame for their disappearance. Anna Kemp was born on September 27, 1962, in Dundon, New Zealand. As an adult, she moved to Melbourne, Australia, hoping to build a career, find love, and live her best life. John Miles Sharp was born on February 28, 1967, to Valerie and Miles Sharp. The couple owned several pastry shops and lived a quiet, peaceful life in Mornington, Victoria, John grew up in a large, happy family with four older sisters. Later, the Sharp family welcomed another boy. John Sharp's early years were largely unremarkable. He had social issues and was heavily dependent on his parents. He had low emotional intelligence and lacked the ability to cope with stressors in his life. Sharp completed 12 grades but failed his exams. In addition to a lack of emotional intelligence and an unwillingness to face his own problems, he couldn't handle stress, so he tended to shift decisions onto others. After leaving high school, John took a job at the State Bank, where he met Anna Kemp. At the time of their meeting, Anna was 31, and John was 27. They were very different in temperament. He was always a loner and had no friends because he had been very shy since childhood and could only communicate freely with his family members. Anna, on the other hand, was cheerful, lively, and attentive to others. This greatly attracted John, and he showed her as much attention as he could afford. At first, she did not like him, but then she noticed his interest in her and saw how he opened up around her, transforming from a reserved, silent man into a confident and engaging conversationalist. Anna took notice, and the young couple began dating. In October 1994, they married. The ceremony was modest and took place in a close family circle. Anna's close relatives from New Zealand also attended the wedding, but they did not share her choice, thinking that Anna was too good for him. Decorum prevented them from voicing their opinion out loud, so the parents remained silent and supported their daughter's choice. However, during the honeymoon, Anna herself began to doubt the correctness of her choice. In a phone conversation with her mother Lila, she complained that she had rushed into it and that there was no real strong love between her and John. But being a devout Catholic, she accepted her choice and decided to try to establish good family relations with her husband and become a full family. They lived together for seven long years in various places around the Mornington coast and appeared to be a perfectly happy family. But in reality, they lived their lives separately. By the end of 2001, Anna and John learned they were expecting a child. Anna was happy as she had long dreamed of having a child, but John was opposed, as they had agreed before marriage, that they would not have children. Anna disregarded John's opinion and kept the pregnancy. Thus, in August 2002, Baby Gracie Louise Sharp was born. The little girl had a difficult start to life as she was born with hip dysplasia. This is a congenital malformation of the joint that is corrected by wearing a special brace for a long time. The principle of such a brace involves bending the child's legs at the knee and hip joint and holding them in such a position. Wearing the brace around the clock creates certain discomfort for sleep and full life. Such inconveniences for the little newborn girl were very difficult during the first few months of life. It was expected that this condition would not create long-term problems for Gracie, but in infancy, 
she felt very uncomfortable and experienced significant distress while wearing the brace. But Anna cared for her daughter with complete dedication, hoping to remove the brace as soon as possible. The girl was very weak, ate poorly, slept little, required constant attention and care. Anna's time was entirely occupied with caring for her daughter. John was dissatisfied that his wife, Anna, devoted all her time to their daughter, Gracie, and their marital relationship grew increasingly tense. However, Anna was unconcerned with John's feelings, as she was fully occupied with their daughter. Even after the removal of Gracie's brace, her sleep issues worsened, prompting Anna to seek professional help. The ordeal was exhausting for her. Anna quit her job to dedicate all her time to Gracie. The Sharp family was financially well off and wanted for nothing. In previous years, John had started a company in property staging and flipping, which allowed them to build a substantial financial cushion. In late 2003, the couple bought a house on Prince Street, close to John's parents' home. Soon after moving in, Anna surprised John with news of her second pregnancy. Anna was thrilled, as she had dreamed of having two children, but John was very displeased with the news and even once questioned whether the child was his. Despite their differences, their relationship appeared to be quite good. On March 21, 2004, Anna, John, and little Gracie were invited to a family celebration. They seemed perfectly happy, and none of the attendees noticed anything unusual. But two days later, Anna disappeared. John behaved oddly, perhaps each person grieves in their own way, but he did not report her missing to the police, nor did he look for her among friends and relatives, as if he knew where his wife was. And so it turned out. Sometime later, John confidently told Anna's mother in a phone conversation that she had run off with another man. He explained that he didn't know where she was or with whom. He also mentioned that Anna had taken her mobile phone with her. However, little Gracie stayed with John. This was most strange to Anna's relatives. They couldn't believe it, knowing that Gracie was neither needed nor of interest to John, and Anna would never have done such a thing. Anna's relatives never believed the story John told them. They knew Anna well enough to believe that she would never leave her Gracie, who still required constant care. On March 28th, John called her parents again and reported that Anna had come home by taxi and taken Gracie. He also stated that Anna would not return and that the child she was expecting was not his. This news completely dismayed the Kemp family. What John told them about Anna was not true to their daughter, but Anna's mother was adamant that her daughter would not leave the house, especially 20 weeks into her pregnancy. So who is John Sharp, a grief-stricken father and husband, or a participant in the disappearance of his own family? Over time, Anna's family received a letter via social media, stating that she had moved to another city to start a new life with a new lover, and asked not to be disturbed until she was fully settled. In the letter, she wrote that she was unhappy in her marriage to John, was tired, and wanted to start over in a new relationship. But Anna's relatives knew she would never behave like that. She would call, talk, and not hide like a fugitive. Moreover, the letter was not written in Anna's style, which cast significant doubt on whether it was actually penned by her. The facts that Anna herself wasn't answering phone calls, that she was unreachable, and the strange letter, seemingly not written by Anna herself, compelled her relatives to contact the police. Following protocol, the New Zealand police called John Sharp, but were told the same story about her leaving him for another man. There were enough suspicions to report the case to the police in Mornington, Australia, who immediately contacted John. Sharp failed to convince the police that everything was fine, and they promptly referred the case to the Victoria Missing Persons Unit. Within a few hours, an investigative team was dispatched. However, the truth is not always obvious and the police conducted a thorough check. They visited the Sharp home where John remained alone. John cooperated with the investigation and appeared genuinely distraught and upset. He recounted how Anna, upon leaving for the first time, got into a blue car. He reported that Anna and Gracie had moved to Chelsea. They took all their belongings and are likely now happily living their new life without him. After John's testimony, the police asked to inspect the house and he agreed without hesitation. The first floor looked completely normal. The inspection of the second floor somewhat surprised the investigators. The main bedroom lacked a mattress, and the children's room was missing a crib. John explained that he had sold the mattress, and Anna had taken the crib to their new home. The police then checked Anna's phone. The last calls were to an insurance company and one from an unknown number. In the first case, 
she wanted to add a new family member to the insurance. The unknown number turned out to be from a regular TV repairman. It turned out Anna had arranged for him to come and repair the television in their living room on March 24th, which had been broken for a long time. The police located this repairman, and he said that when he arrived for the job, John answered the door and told him that his services were not needed as the television was already working. The police also checked social networks, but Anna did not use them. Despite their efforts, the investigators found no evidence that Anna Sharp had another man in her life. John reported that Anna had come home for Gracie by taxi, but no taxi company confirmed this trip. A significant lead in the search for Anna Sharp was a bouquet of flowers she sent on her mother's birthday with a signed card. However, the words in the card did not seem like wishes from Anna, again causing her family to doubt that everything was all right with her. Bank statement details showed that the bouquet was indeed paid for with Anna Sharp's card. As there were no witnesses or evidence to support John's claim that Anna had gotten into a blue car on the purported day she left, nor was there any evidence of bus, plane tickets, or hotel bookings. Anna's friends had absolutely no information that could confirm the story that she had run off with another man. So, what happened to Anna Sharp and her young daughter? On June 10th, John Sharp was questioned by the police again, but he stuck to his story. After the questioning, John Sharp was released. However, this was a tactical move by the investigators as they had put John under surveillance, hoping to catch any clue that could aid in the search. John Sharp was a loner who hardly made any calls and didn't entertain guests, so the investigators had undercover police follow him. During this period, John gave a memorable TV interview in which he tearfully pleaded with Anna to contact him, holding a photograph of Gracie and crying insincerely. The surveillance team continued to tail him and one day caught him in a suspicious act. After the interview, he drove to Chelsea Beach. He walked cautiously, frequently looking over his shoulder to ensure no one was watching or following him. He approached a specific bush on the shore and pulled out a white plastic bag. Taking it, he returned to his car. There, he took a phone out of the plastic bag and made a call, then drove to the nearest ATM and withdrew cash. After that, he put everything back in the bag and buried it under the bushes on the beach. All these suspicious activities were captured on video by the surveillance team. Then John went home and called the missing persons department, claiming his wife had just called him and withdrawn cash from their joint account. After obtaining video evidence of Sharp disposing of incriminating evidence in a trash bin and retrieving a credit card hidden in the plastic bag, he was arrested. During initial interrogations as a suspect, John continued to repeat his story. However, he could not explain why he buried Emma's phone and her bank card. John fell silent. The detectives knew they needed to find another way to get through to him, so they invited his parents, showed them the incriminating footage of their son on Chelsea Beach, and then sent them to talk to him. An hour later, they emerged, and Sharp was ready to talk. Initially, John Sharp stuck to his story, but eventually, he confessed to the elimination with a spear gun of 41-year-old pregnant Anna Marie Kemp Sharp and 20-month-old Gracie Louise Sharp. During press conferences with John, his parents were always present. John would interrupt the conversation and leave the room. He would feel ill. He behaved unnaturally. He would roll his eyes and cry. According to him, Anna was a tyrant with a difficult character. He decided to eliminate her to save himself. An adult man ended the life of his pregnant wife because, in his view, she stood between him and his family. But beyond his confession, the police continued to look for evidence. During further searches of the house with detection dogs in the bedroom and little Gracie's room, traces of blood were found. In the trash, they found notes where John had written everything he planned to say during interrogations. A torn photo with the name Francis was also found. Anna had hoped to name their expected son Francis. In subsequent interrogations, John Sharp detailed how he had planned the end of his pregnant wife and then his young daughter. On the evening of March 23rd, the couple argued, after which Anna went to bed, but John did not. He wallowed in self-pity, believing his marriage was unhappy. It was then he decided to retrieve his spear gun from the garage. The circumstances of buying the spear gun were quite suspicious as John Sharp had never shown any interest in spearfishing or any sport requiring such equipment. Nevertheless, he bought two spears for the gun using cash, leaving no trace that could prove the purchase of the weapon. While his wife slept, he loaded the gun and returned to their bedroom. 
John positioned the gun just inches from her left temple and fired into her skull. The shot did not instantly end Amma's life, so Sharp took the second spear and fired again. He then covered his now-deceased wife with towels to avoid looking at her face, went downstairs, and slept on the couch. The next day, John Sharp woke up and went about his day as usual. He dropped his daughter Gracie off at daycare, came home, and a TV repairman visited while Amma's body still lay in the bed upstairs. After the repairman left, John tried to remove the spears stuck in his pregnant wife's head. It was a difficult task, so Sharp decided to unscrew the shafts and leave the spear tips inside Anna's skull. Then, he dug a shallow grave in the backyard and buried her, throwing her into a dirty pit. He then casually went to pick up his daughter from daycare, as if nothing had happened. The deception began. John Sharp made up an elaborate story about his wife leaving him for another man, and told it to his mother-in-law in New Zealand. On March 27, 2004, John put his daughter Gracie to bed. He drank several glasses of whiskey and coke. While intoxicated, he went to the garage and loaded his shotgun with a spear he had just purchased and buried the other two spear tips in the backyard with his wife. He then walked over to Gracie's crib and aimed the weapon at her head. Either Sharp closed his eyes or the alcohol prevented him from aiming, but the first shot penetrated Gracie's skull but did not cut off her life. She screamed in agony as the spear slammed into her head. Then he reloaded the gun and fired two more shots at Gracie. Amazingly, she survived. Finally, the distraught father pulled the first spear out of Gracie's skull and fired the final fatal shot. John Sharp later admitted that the moment he ended his wife's life, he knew he had to do the same to his daughter. He even took Gracie with him to the sporting goods store to buy new spears for the shotgun. The next day, Sharp covered his daughter's face with a towel because he couldn't bear to look at her dead face and removed the spears from Gracie's head. He then wrapped her in garbage bags, secured her body with duct tape, and threw his daughter into a landfill along with her toys and the weapons he used to end her life. Then John exhumed Anna's body and dismembered it with a chainsaw. He wrapped the body parts in trash bags and secured them with tape. He then placed them in the trunk of his car and drove to the landfill. The investigators had enough evidence for an arrest, but did they have enough to charge and convict him? There was still hope that further surveillance might lead them to the bodies. However, after several days of inactivity from John Sharp, the team decided to arrest him and bring him back to the missing persons department. John Sharp's confession to the ends of his wife and daughter was just the beginning of the horror. The task of finding the bodies he dumped at the landfill like trash was daunting. Due to space constraints, bins from the Mornington City dump were transferred to another landfill. The trash bags were traced to an incident location in Tuarong, and thanks to meticulous waste management at the landfill, police were able to pinpoint an area of about 100 square meters where they believed the bodies would be found. This saved the team an immeasurable amount of time and effort. At the end of June, extensive searches began, and for the next three weeks, the police meticulously sifted through the trash at the landfill near Devil Bend Reservoir. Australian winter corresponds to summer months, and almost all three weeks were rainy and chilly. However, the search did not stop for a minute. For the police officers searching for the mother and daughter, this case became a personal mission. They ventured out in any weather and on their days off, despite the challenges of working in protective suits, masks, and the daunting environment. After 19 days, Norell Fraser discovered a bundle containing part of Anna Sharp's body. Later, photographs of Anna's mother and other personal items were found at the landfill likely fallen out of the bag when it tore during handling. After this long-awaited discovery, Norell Fraser shared that she would never forget the experience of finding Anna Kemp's body. She felt as if Anna was somehow calling out to her to be found. She also confessed that the initial thrill the team felt at the first discovery quickly faded with the realization that little Gracie must be nearby. I just held my head in my hands and cried. I cried for what Anna went through, for Anna's family, for humanity, I guess. But the thought of Gracie being there... Fraser paused. By the end of July, all bags containing the remains of Anna and Gracie were found. At the trial, John Sharp confessed to the premeditated ends of Anna Camp and Gracie. The adult man explained his act by saying his wife had been getting on his nerves. Therefore, he purchased a spear gun and practiced using it in the shed several days before the act. On the night of the act, after Anna had gone to bed, he grabbed the spear gun and fired at her head while she was asleep. He then buried her in the backyard. The next day, John Sharp went to a hardware store in Frankston 
and purchased a roll of duct tape, two polyethylene tarps, and an electric chainsaw. That same evening, after drinking heavily, he used the same spear gun to fire at his young daughter's head. Over the next few days, Sharp exhumed his wife from her shallow grave, cut her body into three parts, and disposed of her in the same manner as he had his daughter. He placed the body in a garbage bag and discarded it with household trash. As the charade continued, John began a thorough cleanup. He disposed of blood-stained mattresses and sent fake emails posing as Anna. He threw away Gracie's belongings and sent flowers to his mother-in-law for her birthday. In an effort to sustain his deception, John used Anna's bank card in a bank in Chelsea and even sent an email to her mother in New Zealand, pretending to be her. John Sharp appeared on television, pleading with his wife to contact him and her family to reassure them of her safety. Anna, our marriage is over, but I still love you, and you are the mother of our wonderful daughter Gracie, whom we both adore more than anyone else. He signed a written statement to the police, claiming he had nothing to do with her disappearance. John Sharp continued to lie for three months. However, he was no actor, and his script did not have the ending he had planned. On August 5th, 2005, John Miles Sharp was sentenced to two consecutive life sentences for the murder of his pregnant wife and child with no chance of parole for 33 years. He is currently held in solitary confinement due to threats and assassination attempts by fellow inmates. John Sharp, dubbed the Mornington Monster, was sentenced in 2005 to two consecutive life terms and is considered the worst case of familicide in Victoria. Anna and Gracie were buried in Anna's hometown. The name of their unborn son, Francis, is inscribed on their shared headstone. In Gracie's documents, the father's name is now left blank. But did John really murder his wife because of their loveless marriage and his desire not to have another child, or was there another motive? In addressing his dislike for his wife and child, he could have done what many in the modern world do, divorce and move on alone, but that's what any rational person would say. John Sharp, a true monster, chose to solve his problems by ending the lives of his loved ones, Amidst all the madness that had taken over his mind, it's clear that he had lost touch with reality. There's no other explanation. Our story today is about a strong woman who broke down in an instant and made a life-changing decision that fundamentally changed the lives of her entire family. This story will remind everyone how important it is to take your mental health and the mental health of your loved ones seriously and not to be afraid to speak up when things in life don't go the way you want them to. We will visit Atlanta, the capital, and most populous city in the state of Georgia. It's a vibrant, busy tourist city that has grown thanks to giants like Coca-Cola and Delta Airlines. On November 6, 2021, at around 9 p.m., a man called emergency services to report that exhaustive screams and several gunshots were heard coming from a neighbor's house. Police officers rushed to the scene and entered the home. They found a man and a woman dead on the floor. After examining the scene of the tragedy, the police began their investigation. The murdered spouses were Ronell and Kiana Burns. But who would want to kill a married couple and why? The family lived in a large home that was located in the most ethnically diverse county in Gwinnett County. The house itself did not appear to have been burglarized as all belongings were still in their places. But the clue to this double crime came to light very quickly. Let's rewind with you the history of the Burns family, like a movie backwards and see the true cause of the tragedy that occurred. Kiana was born on September 15, 1977 in St. Louis, Missouri. She graduated from Riverview Gardens High School, later at St. Louis Community College in Florissant Valley, where she majored in cosmetology and soon began building her own business career. Kiana opened her own beauty salon, which was popular. The girl was very hardworking, as she always dreamed of a luxurious and rich life. She invested a lot of time in the business, and it paid off. Over the next 20 years, with her persistence and hard work, Kiana turned it into one of the largest beauty salons throughout the St. Louis area. However, the personal life of a young, bright woman did not always go smoothly. Strong, wealthy, and ambitious Kiana was very difficult to find a worthy couple. In her 44 years, she had three children from previous relationships, whom Kiana loved with all her soul. 
Her family described her as a great and loving mother. She knew how to support women, was a good friend, and a successful businesswoman. Kiana had it all when she met her future husband, Ronell Burns. Ronell Burns was born on May 14, 1975, in St. Louis, Missouri. Ronell graduated from the High School of Fashion in 1994. He played on the basketball team and played for a state championship. He was very driven, ambitious, especially loved the competitive spirit and always strived for greatness. When he met Keanu, he had two children of his own from a previous relationship. So fate brought two successful and ambitious people together, and they created a new, strong, and happy family. On September 13, 2012, they officially became husband and wife and celebrated a gorgeous wedding in the presence of numerous relatives and friends. However, soon after the wedding for Kiana began to open new sides of her chosen one, it turned out that at an early age, Ronell dedicated his life to Jesus Christ and wanted to start doing the work of the Lord. He began to serve everyone he could, even those he crossed paths with on the street. Ronell created his own web page on the internet where he began coaching and preaching. Ronell voiced that in his early years, God spoke to him and told him to help people. One of the calls stated, Sometimes he can call everyone, and only he can allow things to happen in life. Ronell continued his ministry. His video messages were very popular on the internet. In addition to his impressive lines as a church coach, Ronell was a financial counselor and insurance agent. He started a company called Traditional Financial Solutions, where he was determined to help people all over the world become financially independent. Ronell was very successful in his business and in his efforts to help, and his speeches did draw large audiences. Kiana supported her husband. Together they gained popularity online as Ronell was already quite well known as a leader and coach in Six Figure Ambition, an online program for entrepreneurs. He had over 7,000 followers on Instagram and 2,000 subscribers on YouTube, where he ran a channel with educational videos. Ronell and Kiana Burns brought their families and business minds together. They dreamed together and ended up creating something great that touched thousands of people. Kiana was known as a speaker at business events where she shared lessons and inspiration on how to succeed. She also had 14,000 followers on Instagram where she shared thoughts on her family life and inspirational quotes. In one of the popular video messages, the beautiful couple dressed exclusively in branded items appeared before their audience. They talked about entrepreneurship and how it has benefited their lives and the lives of thousands of subscribers. The couple spoke loudly that their mission is to convey to their audience how to become successful entrepreneurs, as well as build their fundamental business. The time to build other people's businesses was over. The Burns family wanted to teach young entrepreneurs not to spend all the money they earned, but to invest it skillfully to generate new money that earned itself. The speech ended with the message that the Burnses believe in everyone who believes in them. And the belief is that you don't have to be great to start. You have to start to become great. They have never hidden their luxurious life, instead flaunting it in front of their audience, attracting new students and subscribers. However, in the Burns family, only Kiana has traveled the path that Ronell has repeatedly described. She has worked hard to build and operate an entire network of salons on her own. At the time of their coaching, Kiana owned several salons and was also a successful insurance agent. It was Kiana's business that brought in most of the family's capital. Ronell, in turn, diligently wanted to occupy a winning position, and therefore there was an image of a wealthy family exclusively in expensive clothes. Photos from the best restaurants were published daily. But rich and successful people go ahead, not wasting time on words, and poor people continued to believe the speeches of the Burns family. By tempting stories of how to earn big money without labor, using only the words of his mentor Ronell, he received a lot of interest from the outside because every poor person dreams of becoming rich. So Ronell Burns founded a company with six-figure ambitions. It gave them the opportunity to continue to add to their capital and create their own legacy, which he talked about in every interview. The Burnses created a tight-knit family, and for a long time, 
their entire entourage thought so. Until Ronell suggested that Kiana move from her beloved and native St. Louis to Atlanta. By that time, they already had three children together, Rhea, Makey, and Ray Haley. Parents to their children and well-known in their careers, Ronell and Kiana Burns were inspirational figures that people looked up to. The move to Atlanta was a forced move. They had plans to expand their business. Having owned his wife's business, Ronell dreamed of expanding it. Three beauty salons in St. Louis was no longer enough for him. The ambitious Ronell wanted to establish a chain of salons in Atlanta as well to expand his clientele. Kiana was reluctant to move out of St. Louis but again gave in to her husband and continued to play along with him in front of the public. Kiana Burns painted a rosy picture of her life. On social media, she posted a picture of her receiving a premium Maserati Levant car as a gift from her husband. She also shared photos of her trunk full of Louis Vuitton bags. Each such post was captioned with words of admiration and gratitude to her husband. But, like any blogger, Kiana often dedicated her Instagram feed to her beloved children and family. After a while, the woman couldn't stand it and admitted to her audience that everything in their family is not as smooth as it looks. It turned out that the couple was on the verge of divorce. After moving to Atlanta, Kiana was left alone in a big, unfamiliar city where she had to start all over again. In a video message, she shared with her subscribers that it was hard for her to decide to move and adjust to a new home and new people. You have to be ready for life changes, she said during her Facebook live stream. Things in your life can change for the better or for the worse overnight, literally. If you don't think you're a strong enough person, some things can take you out of yourself. She told her followers that she needed their support as she was going through a difficult time. Kiana admitted that her favorite subscribers are helping her get through the dark days, which had become quite a lot lately. From the outside, no one knew that they were so close to divorcing each other. This confession disturbed the subscribers and Rennell had to speak out live on air too. He revealed that they decided seven months ago that they were going to get a divorce. His words sounded like a business plan again. I'm tired of her. We're going to continue to run our business together going forward, but we're also announcing that we're going to divorce. We've dealt with each other. We've both come to this conclusion, but let's not put pressure and grieve. Everything around us will remain the same. We took out a piece of paper on which we drew a line down the middle. That's how we decided how we're going to divide the business. But for obvious reasons, bloggers share only positive stories with their followers. To tell about failures and failures is to lose faith and, in the case of the Burns family, their status, which has been built up over the years. However, being public figures, it soon did become clear that the family's wealthy life was just a picture for social media. Ronell, in his hunt for fame and popularity, very quickly squandered all the money Kiana received from beauty salons. But he did not stop there, and the debt of the Burns family to various banks in a few years reached more than $500,000. Obviously, the move to an unfamiliar city and financial difficulties reached their peak. On the eve of the tragedy, Kiana Burns went live and interacted with her subscribers. She went live where she asked her fans to pray for her strength as she struggles without the support and help of family and friends, especially as she cares for her children. In the post, Kiana talked about life changes and shared how she and her husband moved to Atlanta to expand their business just five or six months ago. She wrote, I tell you that if you don't pray and keep the faith, things can change and take you away. She also spoke of the existence of a supportive love circle that will help you and talk to you about things that you just can't seem to get past. Because if we leave things to chance, we start to think to ourselves and make bad decisions. At the end of her speech, she added that any change in life is not always smooth sailing. Learning about new environments and new people, especially without the support of immediate family and friends, is sometimes very difficult. The woman also admitted that she is working with her mental health and worries that she is not strong enough to take on the challenges of fate. But was the move the main reason for the imbalance in the family? 
In that speech, Kiana was silent that the real cause of the rift was Ronell's numerous cheating and promiscuous life, which always remained behind the scenes of their happy life on Instagram. However, on the same night, she posted a video again where she was dancing merrily at home with one of her daughters. A few hours later, the unthinkable happened. Kiana and Ronell had a long argument. She then grabbed a gun and shot him, then herself. Authorities were first called to the Burns home. By the time police arrived, neighbors had gathered outside and said they heard gunshots coming from inside. Preliminary stages of the investigation determined that Ronell Burns had shot himself. But soon discovering Kiana's bloody body in the next room with a gun in her hands, it became apparent that the decision had come from a woman. The motive was clear, but some people claimed that Kiana was forced to kill her husband after she discovered he was cheating on her. Another version said that the couple was in terrible debt and that Ronell turned out to be a common con man who ended up cheating on her. People who believed this family dug hard into their lives in search of the truth. They discovered some very compromising information from Ronell's ex-wife. She claimed that during her divorce proceedings, she had learned that Ronell was a habitual chronic cheater. During that time period, he was extremely irresponsible with his wife's money and also failed to hold down any jobs, which ultimately led to ruin and a ruined credit history for his now ex-wife. Then he met Keanu. She was actually of great interest to Ronell, as she was a successful career woman. She in turn was attracted to Ronell's confidence and swagger. Kiana's fortune and Ronell's experience seemed to be a winning combination, but these expectations were not met and all their business endeavors eventually collapsed. Only Kiana's beauty salon remained afloat, and from that moment on, despite the lack of income from Ronell, he actively continued to convince everyone what a successful businessman he was. The family successfully hid the real state of affairs and their severe lack of money on social media, continuously showing off expensive purchases. They also carefully hid the problems in their relationship behind happy photos together. On his account, Ronell continued to publish posts about his business endeavors, where he claimed that everything he takes on becomes successful and profitable. The Burns couple showed themselves to be devout Christians, and in each post, they added quotes from the Bible and other holy scriptures that fit the meaning of the speech. The couple also posted photos of their luxurious residence, showing the public their wealth and family in great detail. However, all these photos, which they showed in their home or at a party in front of cars or on vacation, in reality were only a cover and show. Ronell worked for an American marketing insurance company that extorted money from middle and lower income families. In fact, the man tried to involve even his family members and friends in this fraudulent scheme in order to raise his status, but Ronell did not get enough money from this activity in the firm and could not support himself. They kept convincing everyone around them that the new business was successful and they themselves were successful entrepreneurs. Their arrogance was so strong that they even made a TV series about themselves, calling it Meet the Burns. Everything they supposedly earned was immediately spent on a lavish lifestyle and a desire to feel like someone they really weren't. Such profligacy eventually led them to bankruptcy. So on December 19, 2019, Kiana and Ronell Burns filed an official bankruptcy petition. The couple had to liquidate some of their assets to pay off their creditors. While this was going on in their lives, Ronell and Kiana still continued to pretend like nothing was going on. They continued to portray themselves as a happy family and successful businessmen. But in St. Louis, it was getting harder and harder to do that. So Ronell decided that their family should move to a bigger city so that he could continue to scam more people with impunity. This became another stupid and failed decision on his part. They still had a thriving business that was the family's only source of income. Unfortunately, Kiana once again went along with her husband and agreed to the move. Kiana couldn't get used to Atlanta. She already knew that her husband had cheated on her repeatedly. The woman was tired of being patient and silent. Together, they made the decision to divorce. 
but in papers filed on October 10, 2021, Rennell listed his wife's infidelity as the reason for the divorce. Kiana was destroyed, but she understood the reasons as family and friends had no idea of the couple's difficulties. Rennell hid the truth from the public in hopes of preserving his image. On October 20th, 10 days after Rennell filed for divorce, Kiana went on live TV that day to talk about something much more serious. The bright smile she often displayed was now replaced by an expression of concern and sadness. After divorcing his first wife, conman Ronell Burns had remarried the successful and wealthy Kiana, and using his new image as a devout guru, he seemed a changed and reliable man. But in reality, he hadn't changed and continued to take advantage of his new wife's trust and money by playing the successful businessman. What seemed like a perfect union was over. On November 9, 2021, 44-year-old Kiana Burns shot and killed her husband, 46-year-old Ronell Burns, before pointing the gun at herself and committing suicide. The Sandy Springs Police Department said no one was home at the time of the murder, but the couple left behind eight children who will now grow up without parents. Police said there was no history of domestic violence at the family's Atlanta home. Kiana Burns committed this a few weeks after asking her Facebook friends to pray for her. The reasons for this decision by Kiana Burns are unknown. One can only speculate what prompted the strong-spirited woman to make such a drastic decision. It is obvious that at that time she saw only such a way out while in a difficult condition. She withdrew into herself through unsolvable inner problems. She was tired of appearing to be happy instead of being happy. All their life together, they had portrayed that they were happy. However, everything in this family was a farce and a game. Absolutely everything. Kiana was tired of lying. It's hard to judge what a person does under a cloud of depression and other debilitating mental disorders, but it's also hard to understand why so many children are left alone in this world, essentially to fend for themselves. News of the influential couple's death has traveled throughout their vast network of friends and colleagues. The death of Ronell Burns and his wife Kiana has been widely publicized on social media. Numerous followers and friends shared words of regret describing the couple. People close to the couple paid tribute. One post written by a family friend shows that even people very close to the couple didn't know the real truth about the family until the end. Ronell Burns was someone who felt the need to flaunt his success and luxury, and these are usually the most insecure people. He got so caught up in his own self-belief that he mistook his sense of self-worth for a sense of self-importance. Imitating a stormy activity, he was able to ruin the life of more than one diligent and successful woman. Such people have no pride and no sense of dignity. He's just an ordinary con man who dragged his wives to the bottom. But where does a man like him get his pride? He deceived women, making them believe in beautiful fairy tales of happiness and success that awaits them only with him, because it is known that women love with their ears and dream of eternal love. And subscribers, will you say? Who tells subscribers the whole truth? They are strangers for whom they always create a beautiful picture. But do not forget that a beautiful picture, which is depicted on the front side of the paper, always has a backside and what it will be decide only you. The case of Luz Maria Lopez, from love to violent crime. The crime rate in Guatemala is extremely high. According to statistics, at least 100 crimes are committed here per week, half of which are so-called domestic crimes, and almost 70% of serious crimes remain unsolved. According to The New Yorker, fewer civilians died in the Iraq war zone in 2009 than in Guatemala. It was in this beautiful but dangerous country that the tragic events that will be discussed today took place. The story of an attractive young woman named Luz Maria Lopez started out romantic and promising, but ended up as a handful of ashes in a bag thrown down a sewer manhole. She was victimized by a domestic tyrant whom she herself spent years forgiving over and over again, giving him a chance to mend his ways. There was a lot of controversy in this case, and the perpetrator could have avoided responsibility. But let's go over everything in order. Who is Luz Maria Lopez? The full name of our today's heroine, given to her at birth, 
Sounds like Luz Maria del Rocio Morales Lopez. She was born in 1995, March 17th, in the small town of San Cristobal Verapaz, in a simple and rather modest family of Ada Morales and Brian Lopez. Luz Maria was the youngest of two children of her parents and was raised with her older brother Omar. As an infant, the girl nearly died due to an intestinal obstruction. To save her life, a complex operation was performed and doctors gave no guarantees. But the baby's mother prayed for her recovery and believed that her daughter would recover. So soon it happened, and the surgery itself at such an early age fortunately did not affect the development of the girl. During her school years, Luz Maria was actively engaged in sports, in particular, attended sections of gymnastics and athletics, and was also fond of classical choreography. She was a creative person, easily found a common language with different people and quickly made friends. The girl also studied well and had an aptitude for the humanities. After graduating from school, Luz Maria thought about getting a higher education and decided to enter a prestigious state university. She chose law and later decided to specialize in criminalistics because this direction has always aroused her genuine interest. A Fateful Encounter when Luz Maria was a student, she and her mother visited a car dealership in Coban, the capital of Alta Verapaz. It was her older brother's 25th birthday that year, and her parents and sister wanted to give him a special gift, a motorcycle, which he had long dreamed of. In the showroom, they were met by a polite and very attentive young consultant who introduced himself as Jorge. He showed the buyers the whole assortment and gave some recommendations. Mother and daughter chose a model, but decided to think more and consult with the head of the family. Leaving, they took a business card of the car dealership and also Luz Maria left her phone number for feedback. Soon the girl received a call from Jorge, the same consultant from the salon, but the conversation was not about the upcoming purchase, but was more of a personal nature. After that, Jorge dialed Luz Maria's number several more times before he dared to ask her out to a coffee shop. It was obvious that he liked the beautiful, sultry brunette very much, but he did not know where to begin the acquaintance. It should be noted that Luz Maria also liked this handsome young man, so on his proposal to meet, she responded with consent. The guy was a year younger than her, but such a small difference in age was not an obstacle for them. Almost immediately, a romantic relationship began between them, which developed rapidly. Both felt that it was true love at first sight and believed that a long and happy life was ahead of them. After only a few months, the couple decided to live together, and although their parents did not approve of such a rush, the young people were soon married. About six months later, the lovers played a wedding, inviting only the closest people to the celebration. Curiously, the problems began on the day of the wedding, when the institution where the banquet was to be held there was a hitch because of which the holiday was almost derailed. The couple had to overpay a considerable amount of money so that the wedding, after all, took place at the appointed time. Who is Jorge? About who was the chosen one of Luz Maria, there is very little information in the public domain. It is known that he was born in 1996 in the town of Santa Catalina La Tinta, which is in the central part of Guatemala. Jorge was the eldest of two sons and was raised with his brother Pablo. His family balanced on the brink of poverty so that the boys as children were not spoiled with beautiful clothes and expensive toys because the money was enough only for the bare necessities. But Jorge somehow did not aspire to a better life, so he did not bother to study and look for a decent job. The young man, as they say, just went with the flow. People who knew Jorge personally spoke about him as a withdrawn, uncommunicative, and sometimes aggressive guy. He really had problems with controlling emotions, because of which Jorge did not have many friends and poorly formed relationships with the opposite sex. Nevertheless, when he met the girl of his dreams, he made every effort to win her love, and then he was in a hurry to get married, fearing that she might change her mind. By the way, the parents of Luz Maria from the very beginning treated her son-in-law with suspicion. There was something about this young man they definitely did not like, but they could not say what it was and could not dissuade their daughter from marrying him. An Unhappy Marriage 
Soon after the wedding, the young wife became pregnant, but since she had not yet managed to get a university degree, she could not find a good job. No one wanted to take a girl with no experience who was in an interesting position, so she had to make do with casual labor. Her husband by that time and lost his job, but was in no hurry to burden himself with a new occupation. When the couple had a daughter, who was named Alice, with money in the family was quite tight. Both spouses were unemployed, they had no money, not only to pay for rented housing, but even to buy food and the most basic things needed in the household. Then Jorge convinced his wife that the only way out for them would be to temporarily move to live in his parents' house. Luz Maria refused for a long time, but since they had no choice, and they could not stay on the street with a baby in their arms, the young woman eventually agreed. Ada knew about the problems in her daughter's family, and repeatedly persuaded her to return to her native home, but she persisted in saying that everything would soon get better with her husband, and there was no reason to worry. One day the mother decided to visit her daughter and granddaughter, but coming to the house of her son-in-law's parents, found there a frightening picture. Luz Maria was in a deplorable state. She ate only once a day and then a little. Horte's family did not think it necessary to feed their unemployed daughter-in-law. Luz Maria was breastfeeding her young daughter, so malnutrition could affect not only her health, but also the health of the child. However, the meager food was only a small part of all the troubles and problems Luz Maria faced in her mother-in-law's home. As it turned out, there she was constantly humiliated and even beaten by her husband's younger brother. This guy was annoyed by the crying of the child, as well as the presence of children's things in the house, so much so that he repeatedly threw them at Luz Maria, and once, once again launched a baby bottle at her and hit little Alice, who was in her mother's arms. Jorge saw all this, but never once stood up for his wife and daughter, and acted as if they were strangers to him. Ada convinced her daughter to take her granddaughter and return to her parents' house, but soon Jorge appeared on their doorstep, asking his wife to return and promising to get a job. She agreed, but only after the young people were able to rent an apartment and live separately from Jorge's parents. When Luz Maria defended her diploma, she was able to fulfill her longtime dream and got a job in the city prosecutor's office. A smart, talented, and very responsible young woman, she quickly gained the respect of her colleagues and gradually began to move up the career ladder. Over time, the family's financial situation improved considerably, so much so that the couple could afford to buy a car for two. However, this was solely the merit of the wife, who worked hard, spared no expense, and was well regarded by her superiors. Jorge was still in search of himself, and preferred to live at the expense of his wife, jealous, lazy, and a domestic tyrant. The young husband had an explosive temper, and the situation only worsened with time. He did not want to work, interrupted by temporary part-time jobs, and even then, not often. He preferred to sit at home in front of the TV, drinking beer with friends, and spending what his wife earned. In addition, Jorge was pathologically jealous and tried to control every move of his beloved. He did not allow her to make friends, to have lunch with colleagues in cafes, or just to be somewhere without him. He constantly checked her phone, looked at the history of calls and read messages, and also forbade her to register accounts in social networks. At home, when left alone, the husband behaved no better. He made scandals in the middle of nowhere, constantly clarified relations, and always blamed his wife for all the problems and family troubles. When they lived in the house of his parents, Jorge never stood up for his wife and just watched how she humiliated, insulted, and sometimes even beat his relatives. Jorge himself also occasionally gave the will of his fists and did not see anything wrong in it. He treated Luz Maria as his property, believing that she would endure everything and would not go anywhere from him. Neighbors often heard the screams coming from the house of the couple, as well as saw on the face and body of the young woman signs of beatings. Repeatedly, Lopez tried to leave her husband and wanted to file for divorce. She several times took her daughter and moved out of the rented apartment in the house of her parents, but her husband every time came there and literally on his knees begged her forgiveness. And each time Luz Maria forgave him, giving him another chance, even though her parents asked her to come to her senses and leave this abusive man. 
On December 15, 2020, after another fight with manhandling, Luz Maria took three-year-old Alice, got into the car, and came to her mother in tears. A day later, Jorge arrived there, and it was unclear whether he wanted his wife or the car back. He said that he had found a job, and now their lives would change, and he also swore that he would never raise a hand on his wife again in his life. Surprisingly, Luz Maria believed him again and went with her husband to their rented apartment. In mid-January 2021, Luz Maria called her mother to complain that her husband had not only failed to get a job as promised, but had also stolen the money she had earned, effectively leaving the family destitute. Ada felt sorry for her daughter and said she would give her some money so that she and her granddaughter would have enough for everything they needed until her daughter received her salary. The women agreed to meet on the morning of January 19th, but Luz Maria did not arrive at the appointed time. Moreover, she did not answer phone calls and messages, which was unusual for her. Concerned, Ada decided to go to her daughter's workplace the next day, but there she learned that Luz Maria had not shown up for the second day and that no one had been able to contact her. At the same time, Jorge, who was also looking for his wife, arrived at the prosecutor's office. According to him, they had once again quarreled, and he thought that Luz Maria had gone to her mother's house and was not answering her calls because she was offended by him. Ada immediately sensed something wrong and assumed that her son-in-law was lying, so she went straight to the police so that the search for Luz Maria could begin as soon as possible. That same day, an alert system was announced nationwide under the code name Isabel Claudina. In the original, Alerta Isabel Claudina. This meant an emergency search for a young woman reported missing. When the massive search began, the missing woman's husband was the first person to be named as a suspect, although it would be more accurate to say that he was the only suspect in the case. Luz Maria had no enemies. There was no reason to believe that she had been kidnapped, and the last person who saw her alive was Jorge. Naturally, this guy denied his involvement in the case, claiming that he himself was knocked down in search of his wife and now extremely indignant and annoyed by the fact that he became the main suspect. At the same time, he himself was constantly confused in his testimony and could not clearly explain why he did not inform the police about the disappearance on the day of his wife's disappearance, and if he thought that she was at his mother-in-law's house, why he did not call or go there. While the police were searching for witnesses and combing the area, the body of the missing Luz Maria was accidentally discovered by municipal workers. On January 22nd, several workers arrived to a call about a clogged storm drain near the road. When they lifted the grate, they saw a strange large plastic bag with something black in it. As they looked closer, they realized that what they were looking at were charred human remains. They immediately reported the gruesome discovery to the police, and the police officers who arrived suggested that the body found could be that of Luz Maria Lopez, who is wanted all over the country. Forensic experts confirmed that the remains belonged to a young woman and her parents and brother at the identification, despite the fact that the body was badly disfigured by fire, confirmed with certainty that it was her. It is noteworthy that the package was found on the same street where the building of the prosecutor's office, where the deceased worked, was located, except that there were no surveillance cameras as well as lighting in that place. Despite the fact that the body was badly burned, pathologists were able to establish that the woman was severely beaten and the cause of her death was asphyxia. This was evidenced by internal hemorrhages, several fractures sustained while she was still alive, and particles of caked blood in her nose and mouth. There were deep marks on her neck indicating strangulation. It's a strange message. At the time of the discovery of the body, no new suspects had emerged in the case and the victim's parents had no doubt that it was the son-in-law who had so brutally murdered their daughter. Jorge was immediately taken into custody, and the motive for his heinous act was being investigated. Also, psychologists' criminalists had to analyze in detail this marriage and the relationships formed within the family. At the investigation, Ada Lopez provided a frightening audio recording which was sent to her anonymously by someone who lived in the neighborhood with her daughter and son-in-law. Apparently, this person has repeatedly witnessed the family scandals of the couple 
and this time decided to record their quarrel, not suspecting that everything will end in a brutal murder. The audio recording clearly shows Luce Maria desperately screaming and crying for help, while in the background little Alice sobs in the background. Ada was horrified by what she heard. She stated that if that witness had called the police right away, her daughter might be alive right now. The man who made the recording not only did not call the police, but did not even visit the house from which the horrible screams were coming. The police also failed to trace the anonymous person, so it was not possible to involve him in the investigation as a witness. The audio recording was attached to the materials of the criminal case, and Ada gave a big interview, during which she called on all citizens to be vigilant and report to the police about the revealed facts of domestic violence, and not just to film them on camera or record them on a dictaphone. According to the woman, such simple actions will help save someone's life. This high-profile crime caused a widespread public outcry, and thousands of people took to the streets, staging rallies across the country to demand that the killer be punished. Although Jorge was taken into custody almost immediately, he continued to deny his guilt, saying that he personally drove his wife to work that fateful day, after which she disappeared. Street CCTV footage did indeed show the couple's car traveling in the direction of Luz Maria's workplace that morning. However, due to the tinted windows, it could not be clearly established how many people were in the car. Also, none of the recordings showed the car stopping and Luz Maria getting out of the cabin. The next curious discovery was made at the couple's rented home, where numerous washed-out traces of blood and drag marks were found. This suggested that this was where the brutal crime had taken place. Suspicions were confirmed when microscopic fragments of burnt flesh were found in the trunk of the family car. In addition, during the search, the investigator was interested in the recent purchase made by the couple, namely, a double orthopedic mattress. More precisely, not even the mattress itself, but the dense polyethylene in which it was wrapped. As the comparative analysis showed, it was in it that Jorge had packed the burnt remains of his wife. It was also possible to find several witnesses from among the neighbors of the family who repeatedly heard Jorge insulting his wife and threatening her with death. A few days before Luz Maria's sudden disappearance, her husband had shouted that he would kill her if she decided to leave him and that he would hide her body so that no one would ever find it. The Picture of the Crime Based on the data that managed to collect expert criminologists, as well as relying on the testimony of several witnesses, the investigation of the pieces restored the gruesome picture of the crime. The murder occurred on the night of January 19, 2021, the day before the spouses had a big fight, and Jorge again gave the will of his fists. He had problems with controlling outbursts of anger before, but this time he simply went into a rage. He hit his wife several times, causing her to scream and cry for help. It was these screams that the neighbors of the family heard, but did not call the police. In the process of beating, Jorge broke his wife's nose and also caused her a head injury. After that, he strangled her with his bare hands and then attempted to dispose of the corpse. To do so, he dragged the body out into the backyard, doused it with campfire liquid, and set it on fire. However, Jorge did not expect his funeral pyre to be so smoky and the stench of burning meat and hair to eat away at his eyes. He was afraid that the neighbors would notice it, suspect something wrong and call the fire department or the police. So he quickly put out the fire, wrapped the burnt remains in plastic, and then went to find a secluded place where he thought the body would never be found. The most horrible thing was that Jorge committed all these atrocities in front of their young daughter, who, due to her age, although not fully, but understood what was happening. The child, who was three and a half years old at the time, saw the beating and the crime, as evidenced by the child's cries and screams, which were also caught on tape. Jorge, who had some knowledge of forensics thanks to his wife's textbooks, which were in abundance in their home, tried to cover up the crime and establish an alibi. He found a stretch of road where there were no lights or video cameras, and dumped his wife's body in a drainage sewer there, going unnoticed. The next morning he drove to her place of work along the usual route, as if he had driven Luz Maria there, as he did every morning, and the next day he began to simulate an active search for his wife, 
calling her colleagues, acquaintances, and relatives. Trial and Verdict The criminal's lawyers delayed the trial as much as they could, and also tried to throw the investigation off track. They insisted that all the evidence and witness statements were circumstantial, and there was not a single piece of evidence that would unequivocally prove Jorge's guilt. Defense attorneys tried to get the detention changed to house arrest, and also argued that Jorge himself was deeply depressed by the fact that he was accused of killing the woman he loved and the mother of his child. However, the decisive evidence was the data obtained from Luz Maria's phone. All this time, the gadget was in her husband's possession, and on the first day after the crime, he sent from it several messages to different people, trying to create the appearance that Luz Maria is alive. Also having tracked all the movements of the smartphone that day, it was clear that it was constantly in the same places as Jorge's phone. But the lawyers tried to turn this evidence in favor of their client, saying that he found his wife's phone and drove around the city with it in search of her. But no one could explain why Jorge was sending messages from it, as well as calling it from his own cell phone. Another proof of the defendant's guilt was the bruises and scratches on his body found on the day of his arrest. These marks were recorded by experts on photos and indicated that the victim had clearly resisted. The most vivid was a scratch on his neck, but only to find particles of Jorge's epithelium under the fingernails of the murdered could not be found because they were destroyed by fire. But despite the large number of controversial points, the prosecutor asked for the maximum possible punishment for the perpetrator. Court hearings and proceedings were repeatedly postponed due to the raging worldwide pandemic of coronavirus, but in October 2022, the defendant was finally found guilty of the brutal murder of his wife. The man was sentenced to 50 years in prison, although he himself did not admit his guilt. Custody of little Alice was given to her maternal grandparents, who admitted that now the main meaning of their lives is their granddaughter. Greetings, everyone. Welcome to my channel. Today, we're faced with another unfortunate case. On November 6, 2014, Mexico City police officers found human remains. A part of the torso was found in a vacant lot near the exit from the city. A few days later, bags with arms and legs were found in different parts of the capital. The horrifying fact was the absence of fingers on the limbs. The police sounded the alarm. Apparently, a particularly violent criminal was at work in the region. Squads of officers were assembled and combed the streets. The main goal was to find the head and limbs of the unfortunate man and prevent further crimes. At that moment, everyone was sure that this case was the work of a brutal serial killer. The fingers and head were never found. However, thanks to the professional work of forensic experts, it was determined that the remains belonged to the same person. But due to the absence of fingers and teeth, it was impossible to find out who this person was. The story unfolds in North America. The main character, a resident of Mexico City, Alejandra La Fuente, a searing brunette with gorgeous hair and bright brown eyes, which further emphasized the thick black as tar lashes. She had an athletic, trim figure, which she tried to maintain by practicing fitness, yoga, and breathing exercises. Alejandra loved to take care of herself. She could often be found at a beauty salon, massage, or spa. In warm weather, she lounged on the beach doing scientific work, and on cloudy days she could visit tanning salons. In general, we can say that the young woman loved herself very much and considered herself the standard of female attractiveness. Alejandra did not lag behind and in terms of career. Her father is a doctor of sciences, a famous psychiatrist, Alberto da Fuente, he is a luminary of science, deals with such deviations of the psyche, such as schizophrenia and manic disorders, and he is famous not only for his scientific work, but also for his experiments on patients. For Alejandra, her father was an idol. Wanting to achieve the same success, she followed in his footsteps. To do so, she enrolled in the best university for psychiatry and graduated with honors. Her perseverance, resourcefulness, extraordinary intelligence, as well as her father's connections, helped her to write and defend her thesis on manic syndrome. However, in the future, psychiatry, Alejandra did not become engaged in psychiatry. She was attracted by the work of a psychotherapist. Thanks to her father's money, the young woman got a license and opened her office in a new business center in the heart of the capital. 
There was no shortage of clients, but she only saw women. Women with eating disorders, depression, relationship problems, and low self-esteem came for counseling. Alejandra helped to solve family problems, but as it often happens, her personal life left much to be desired. The young woman's first marriage broke up, but in the end, the couple had two children. Two charming girls with Alejandra's eyes and her father's sense of humor. However, Alejandra was not discouraged. In her opinion, two children were no reason to give up on herself. She still dreamed of meeting her other half, a man who could also be a good father to her daughters. Sometime after the couple separated, the ex-husband, whose name is not disclosed, came home to Alejandra. It was a normal practice for the couple. The man would come on weekends to give time to his little girls and help his ex-wife with household chores if needed. However, the ex-husband had no idea that this visit would turn out to be his last. Alejandra asked him to enter the house through the backyard, reasoning that the lock on the front door was jammed. The man made his way into the house. Alejandra said that her youngest daughter was bathing right now and asked him to come into her bathroom. Suspecting nothing, the man went in there. There was a ringing silence in the house. There were no sounds, the usual cartoons, the laughter of children. The man went into the bathroom. There was tape on the floor, and there was no daughter in the filled bathtub. He began to realize that something was going wrong. Right at that second, his ex-wife stood behind him with a hammer and delivered a blow with all her might to his head, then another one. The man fell. Blood was pouring out of the gaping hole in his skull. Everything around him was covered in blood. As the experts later found out, the man had no chance to save himself. Death occurred almost instantly after the first blow with a heavy blunt object. The eldest daughter, who unexpectedly returned early from a friend, became an unwitting witness to this truly horrifying picture. The children often observed their parents' quarrels. Alejandra was determined to be mentally disturbed. She often took it out on her friends. Friends even noticed how the young woman could hit her husband. They often noticed scratches on his arms and neck. As for the housemates, they constantly observed her tantrums in an even place and inadequate behavior. But this time the situation got out of control. The daughter ran out of the house and began to call for help. Almost immediately, a neighbor came running who then called the police squad. The psychologist was arrested and charged with murder. At the station, the young woman was placed in a cell where she had to stay for a month until her first hearing. At the trial, Alejandra denied her guilt. Lawyers put forward a version of self-defense. According to them, the ex-husband was intensely jealous of Alejandra and made up that she was bringing men into the house, which could negatively affect the psyche of little girls. On the day of the crime, he showed up unplanned at his ex-wife's house, went through the back door, hoping to catch his wife with another man, then he pounced on Alejandra, who was in the bathroom at the time trying to put together a nightstand. She then had to exert self-defense, in which she delivered two blows to the back of her ex-husband's head. On June 14, 2012, the sentence was handed down. Taking into account the evidence provided by the defense in the presence of two minor children, Alejandra was sentenced to one year and four months. Thanks to the coordinated work of lawyers and the money of his father, the term behind bars was replaced by a suspended sentence. A couple of months later, the appeal was filed again with a request to drop the charges. The argument was assault in self-defense. Human rights activists asked for a jury trial. They felt unbearably sorry for the poor woman who was presented at trial as a victim of domestic violence. As a result, the court reviewed the case and handed down an acquittal. After her release, the young woman proceeded to provide her psychological counseling as before. She created an image of a victim of gender inequality who fought for her rights like most women in North America and finally won. This created image made Alejandra even more popular to potential clients. Soon, Maria Alejandra met Alan Carrera Cuela, a large Mexican businessman, the son of Adrian Carrera Francis. He was a tall, handsome, and statuesque man. His father had previously been head of special services for the Central District and had achieved considerable success in his career. Soon, Alan expanded his business and created a whole chain of construction stores that began to open all over the country. Part of Alan's business was legalized, but the other part, which few people knew about, was closely connected with crime. 
By the way, it was for this reason that his father was removed from his position when one of his son's financial frauds was uncovered. In addition, Allen had a stake in a criminal group that was engaged in the transportation of psychotropic substances to the United States. Their base was located in a border town and was guarded by purchased police officers. This group controlled a small portion of the trafficking of psychoactive substances in the South. Allen's father was proven to be involved in his son's affairs. The police managed to get a statement out of him, so he was facing a 20-year prison sentence. But on July 18, 2000, Adrian Carrera was released early, thanks to the Witness Protection Program. Immediately after his release, he devoted all his time to his son and his legitimate business. The son grew up quickly, adopting his father's views and experiences. After graduating from college, Alan Carrera decided to follow in his father's footsteps and became an entrepreneur. He was very interested in the store of household appliances, which despite his young years, he completely led himself. This business was not as large as his father's, but it brought good money. There were always a lot of women around him, but Alan from childhood was in love with a classmate whom he took as his wife, smart, beautiful, from a good family. The marriage was short, but bright. Daddy had a beautiful daughter. However, a lot of work and almost total absence of Alan at home led this marriage to divorce. Alan was extremely hard to part with the woman he loved since high school. New novels did not bring pleasure, and loneliness and sadness led to the fact that the man began to drink. Gradually, this grew into a pernicious habit. In an attempt to cope with prolonged depression and love for alcohol, Alan tried many ways, books, AA circles, drips. Until one day, fate did not lead the man to a consultation with the famous psychiatrist Alberto, the father of Maria Alejandra. Alan's now ex-wife was also going through a difficult divorce. Alan was the only man in the young woman's life, and despite the separation, she could not allow anyone else to her. To somehow get rid of her loneliness, Alan's ex-wife also decided to visit a therapist. The psychiatrist, with whom Alan was rehabilitated, explained that he could not lead both spouses for ethical reasons and therefore recommended the woman to turn to Alejandra. However, it is worth noting that he did not inform the clients that Alejandra was his daughter. Alejandra quickly realized that her patient's ex-husband could be a great match. He was said to be a pleasant man in the prime of life and quite wealthy. Not thinking long, Alejandra asked her client to bring her ex-husband for another consultation. According to the therapist, she would be able to solve their problem in one session and break the strong bond between the former spouses. From the very first minutes of the steamy session, Alejandra began to put her plan to seduce the entrepreneur into action. The result did not wait long. Immediately after the session, Alan offered the therapist a cup of coffee to discuss family problems. For propriety, the young woman at first even refused to go on a date, because it was contrary to medical ethics. But the date took place the same evening. Between them quite quickly spun an affair. Soon Alan's ex-wife found out about it. She was shocked. She even wanted to report the incident to the doctor's ethics committee, but she didn't. Alejandra was a very competent specialist and therefore was able to convince her client to let the situation go. After all, it says jealousy and unwillingness to let go of the former spouse. And so, according to the doctor, a happy future will not work. In the commission, Alan's ex-wife decided not to apply, but also with the sessions were over. Meanwhile, the relationship with the newly married couple developed quite rapidly. A few months after the first date, the young people decided to live together. After two more months, they decided to legalize their relationship. But Alan did not even suspect what skeletons in his closet hides his fiance and what were the reasons for divorcing her ex-husband. In April 2014, Alan decided to visit his parents and flew to them for the weekend. It became a great occasion to talk about his beloved and the imminent wedding. Alan's parents were extremely surprised that they would find out such important things so late. They had never heard of Alejandra in their son's life before, which was very strange. A week after the meeting with the parents, the marriage was registered. Interestingly, Alejandra asked her husband not to call her friends and relatives. Invitations were not sent, the wedding was supposed to be modest, and the budget did not allow inviting everyone one would have liked. 
However, as it later turned out, the bride's father did attend the marriage ceremony. At first, the life of the young family seemed like a fairy tale. Young, happy with a huge number of plans and desires. But it did not last long. Alejandra could not hide her hysterical character. Approach the horrifying denouement of this story, but no one suspects it yet. The relationship between the newlyweds began to change dramatically. Alan was a rather secretive person, and with friends, details of personal life did not share. Therefore, about what was happening behind the closed doors of the couple, little was known. However, it was obvious that the former relationship gave a crack, and the couple no longer seemed so happy. After meeting Alejandra, Alan distanced himself from his family. The last straw was the wedding, to which parents were not invited. After that, they even stopped calling each other. Alan's remaining buddies began to notice that his spouse became more nervous, sometimes behaving inadequately and quickly losing her temper. After a couple of such incidents, Alan was very ashamed and decided to minimize joint meetings. Quarrels in the family occurred on a daily basis and almost always unfounded. One evening, Alejandra, by her own testimony, decided to get into her husband's cell phone. As is usually the case, correspondence with some women was discovered, with quite racy content. Of course, it was impossible to turn a blind eye to such things. According to Alejandra, this was the last straw. She reported in court that her husband beat her, insulted and humiliated her in every possible way. When cheating was also discovered, it was pointless to save this marriage. For unknown reasons, Alejandra did not apply traditional methods of psychotherapy and try to save the relationship. Having thought of her husband's cheating, the young woman decided to deal with Alan with a method already known to her. As soon as she made this decision, all her attention could be focused on creating the perfect murder plan. Meanwhile, Alan continued his usual and measured rhythm of life. He didn't even realize what was in store for him. Alan still rarely communicated with his family, but he could not miss the traditional feast, which the family held annually in honor of his beloved grandfather's birthday. Alan, of course, came to the feast, but his parents made it clear that his wife, not the most welcome guest in their house. This situation pissed Alejandra off and further aggravated the relationship in the couple. Was it possible to imagine that this would be the last time the family saw Alan alive? On October 31st, 2014, Alan's phone was last used to send a text message to his family that he had reached home safely after his birthday party. He has not been in touch since then. He hadn't been seen at work for a few days either, which was quite strange because it had never happened before. The entrepreneur was extremely responsible for his work, and soon the launch of a new store was expected, and the presence of the head was simply necessary. The reason for this was a terrifying plan of the spouse, which she put into action. After Alan returned from the holiday, there was another scandal, after which Alejandra decided to immediately dispose of her husband. She added a powerful sleeping pill to the milk he traditionally drank before going to bed. Then she smothered him with a pillow. She enjoyed watching her husband slowly lose consciousness in a pathetic attempt to remove the pillow and take a breath. Then came the hardest part, getting rid of the body. It was a moment she hadn't had time to plan for. Alan was too heavy, so she had to make do with what she had. Time was short, so Alejandra ran to the neighbor's vegetable garden to get an electric saw. With a grim smile on her face, she sawed her husband's body into pieces. Only a true sadist could do such a thing. Then she packed the body parts into garbage bags and had the foresight to cut off fingers and pull teeth. It was these that would help the investigation in identifying the person, in case the body was found. Alejandra stuffed all the bags into suitcases so that she could remove the corpse from the house without suspicion, but she did not succeed. As dawn approached, Alejandra was unable to leave the house with the suitcase unnoticed. An elderly neighbor, who suffered from insomnia, watched her from her window. She was a little alarmed by the young woman's early departure. Besides, for some reason, her husband did not help to lift the heavier suitcases, and Alejandra was behaving very strangely. She was always looking around. At dawn, Alejandra returned home. This surprised the vigilant neighbor even more. As it would later turn out, she had scattered bags of her ex-husband's remains in different neighborhoods to cover her tracks. As the new day dawned, 
she went on with her normal life. On November 6, 2014, Mexican police officers discovered the first horrifying find, a human torso with no teeth and no fingers on the hand. The entire police force was put on alert as the incident was egregious in its level of brutality. Less than a day later, other body parts were found in various parts of the city. It is also interesting that the distance between the places where the packages were found was quite significant. Later, this is what would be attributed to Alejandra's long absence from home. All the body parts were sent to the best forensic laboratory, where experts quickly established the fact that all the parts belonged to the same person. In order to avert suspicion from herself, the perpetrator started writing messages to Alan's relatives. She wanted to avert suspicion, but she only made things worse. She didn't even know that her husband had recently distanced himself from the family and had no contact with his relatives. Alejandra informed Alan's parents on his behalf that they were going on vacation and would be out of touch. The whole plan was ruined by Alejandra's father. Alberto began making phone calls to Alan's father's house. He wanted to clarify if his son-in-law's family knew Alejandra's location. Alberto hadn't heard from her in a while and the patients are very worried about not being able to attend counseling sessions. Later, he calls Alan's relatives again to inform them that his daughter has been found and that she had to be forcibly admitted to the clinic because she is suffering from depression due to her husband's cheating. This greatly frightened the relatives and they tried to find Alan, but all was unsuccessful and then the family of the businessman turned to the police. The laboratory experts decided to compare the remains of the corpse recently found with Alan's characteristics. The similarity was 100% and his relatives also identified him. It was especially hard for Alan's grandfather. Soon after the identification, he became ill with heart disease because it was his only grandson. The investigation issued a search warrant for Alan's home and office. A hillock of fresh earth was found in the backyard of the house. After digging, the man's fingers and teeth were discovered. The find further shocked the capital city. Alejandra was immediately apprehended Traces of blood were also found in one of the rooms, as well as on the trunk of the car and in the garage. At first, Alejandra tried to deny her guilt. She hoped that she would be able to get away with it with impunity, as she had with her previous husband. But the investigation quickly sorted out the case. The testimony of an elderly witness helped. The time she gave coincided with Alan's estimated time of death. Alejandra used her position to obtain a powerful sleeping pill a kind of drug only a doctor could get his hands on. This further aggravated the case. The evidence obtained helped establish a link between Alejandra and the brutal massacre of her husband. CCTV cameras also helped trace that the man had gone into the house and never came out of the house again. The fact that the suitcases were taken out was also confirmed by CCTV footage. On December 10th, 2014, the jury reached a verdict. Alejandra was sentenced to life imprisonment murder with brutality, an attempt to conceal this fact, the use of official position, all this was not in favor of the former psychotherapist. Her father, who through the use of connections and bribes tried to spare his daughter from imprisonment, could not help either. But all he managed to do was to keep the trial closed to the public and the press in order to avoid more publicity. However, he did it all for the sake of his own career. Now hardly anyone else will turn to a specialist who raised such a ruthless monster and could not diagnose problems in time with his own daughter. The case of the death of Alejandra's first husband also came to mind at the trial. However, due to the passage of years, the evidence in this case was not found. The version of Alejandra's father's involvement in what happened was also considered. There were suspicions that he was in collusion with his daughter, and they committed crimes on the basis of scientific interest. However, this idea found no evidence. After several appeals from the victims, the sentence was commuted to death. This is an unprecedented situation. Such sentences are extremely rare in Mexico, especially in these times. The defendant is also not entitled to a review of the case. The house and all the property of the accused must go to the family of the victim, although who can be comforted by this if the person can no longer be brought back? Apparently Alejandra was a pragmatic and cruel woman. She had major mental health issues, although medical examinations denied that she had any. She also harbored the influence of her father and used her official position to carry out her manic plans. 
Impunity after her first crime had only unleashed her. Alejandra felt invulnerable and continued to do evil. Perhaps Alan would still be alive if this horrible woman had not been acquitted the first time. But it was too late to talk about it now. In February 2018, the quiet town of Deltona, located in eastern Florida off the Atlantic coast, was rocked by news of the brutal murder of a young man named Patrick de la Querda. The 25-year-old man was found dead in his home, and the nature of his injuries suggested that the perpetrator had a personal grudge against him. The Patrick de la Cerda case is an example of an almost perfect, elaborate, and planned crime that may well have gone unsolved. Although the murderer was named almost immediately, no direct evidence was found to prove his guilt. As later claimed investigator Chad Weaver, who investigated the case, he realized from the beginning that it would be a real detective, worthy of screen adaptation, in fact, so it happened. Who is Patrick de la Cerda? Patrick de la Cerda was born in June 1992 in one of the most picturesque metropolitan areas, Miami, in the state of Florida. His father, Max de la Cerda, was a native of Spain, and his mother, Patricia Ronza, was born and raised in France, but in the 80s moved to the United States, where he soon married and gave birth to a son. De la Cerda family was very friendly and happy. Patrick grew up in an atmosphere of love, care, and mutual respect. He was a very kind, intelligent, and sociable guy, studied well in school, could easily become the soul of any company and chalk a lot of friends. And also the boy from childhood years was very close to his parents, who did not spare no effort and money to ensure that the son received a good education and grew up a worthy man. The head of the family worked all his life in the field of construction and was an excellent specialist in his field. The family was not rich, but was considered quite well-to-do by the standards of the big city. After graduating from high school, Patrick decided to enter the construction faculty to continue his father's work. When the young man was studying at university, his parents, after almost a quarter of a century of living together, decided to divorce. It should be noted that they parted very quietly and peacefully, without scandals, division of property, and the like. The mother moved to the quiet town of Deltona, located in the east of the state, where she soon remarried. The adult son decided to stay with his father in Miami, where they worked together and were respected and sought after professionals in the construction industry. Despite the divorce of the parents, all family members remained very close and were friendly with each other. They were always in touch with each other, calling and communicating regularly and were always ready to help when needed. Patrick regularly visited his mother in Deltona, told her about everything that was happening in his life, shared his joys and experiences, meeting the girl of his dreams. Thanks to his French-Spanish roots, the young man from an early age had a bright appearance and enjoyed great success with the fair sex. But for him has always been an example of the family in which he grew up, so Patrick did not seek frivolous and fleeting affairs. He dreamed of a bright, mutual feeling and a strong family of his own. With the girl of his dreams, De La Cerda met by chance on the internet, on one of the popular sites where lonely hearts are looking for each other. He registered there and created an account on the advice of a friend, but he himself did not fully believe that it was really possible to meet his soulmate there. One June evening in 2017, without much enthusiasm, he was flipping through the profiles of girls on the site, as suddenly his attention was attracted by a photo which depicted a searing brunette with a rather unusual bright appearance. She had big, just bottomless eyes and a charming smile. Patrick was literally enchanted and decided to write to the beautiful stranger. She responded to his message and a relaxed communication started between them. The girl's name was Jessica Devnani. She was born in 1988 in the city of Orlando located in the central part of the state of Florida. After graduating from high school, she entered one of the local universities where she studied banking, and after graduating, she got a job at a bank branch in her native Orlando. Jessica was also immediately attracted to the handsome young man. For a few days, they corresponded actively on the website and then decided to exchange phone numbers. For the next couple of weeks, they called each other every evening and talked for hours about everything. The couple quickly developed mutual sympathy and trust, so the young people decided to meet in real life. But since they lived in different parts of the state, 
they chose a place about halfway to each other for the meeting. Already on the first date, Patrick realized that Jessica was the girl he had been looking for so long and whom he now does not want to let go. She also liked him immediately, and Jessica was a little confused by the age difference because she was four years older than Patrick. On the way home, Patrick called his mother and told her that he had met the girl of his dreams, whom he wanted to marry and start a family. Patricia heard the joy and excitement in her son's voice, realized that he was serious, and was happy for him. This long-distance relationship lasted several months, and it was a big problem, because the couple could only see each other on weekends, somewhere neutral. Usually, they rented a hotel room in some cozy, secluded place and just enjoyed each other's company. But on Sunday night, everyone flew back to their homes because they had to go to work on Monday morning. Marriage Proposal In December 2017, Patrick moved to Delton, where his mother lived, to be closer to his sweetheart. He bought a house there in a quiet neighborhood and began to carry out some repair work, preparing a cozy nest for the move of his chosen one. But Jessica could not yet so immediately leave work, and they planned a housewarming party for early spring next year. On the eve of the new year, which the couple met together, the young man decided to make his girlfriend a surprise. He arranged fireworks in the backyard of the house, and while Jessica admired the fireworks, got down on one knee and held out a box with a ring, asking her the most important question, will she become his lawful wife? Jessica was unspeakably happy, and of course answered him in agreement. Patrick admitted that he had been looking for a ring suitable for the engagement for a long time, but he had not found the perfect one in any of the jewelry stores. All of them seemed to him not beautiful and refined enough for such an occasion. He chose the best of what was available to be able to make a proposal before the new year, but ordered another one in the jewelry workshop, an exclusive ring, the design of which the young man came up with himself. Something had happened to Patrick. Two months have passed since the engagement. Preparations for the wedding and the upcoming housewarming were in full swing. The couple's choice was approved by their parents, and they themselves were unspeakably happy, preparing for a new stage of their lives. The young people planned to arrange a lavish celebration in Miami, on the shores of the Atlantic Ocean, or in France, where the groom's mother was from. On February 27, 2018, Max de la Cerda, Patrick's father, received a call from a courier the father's number was listed as an additional contact, the courier reported that his son's order was delivered to the specified address. But the customer does not open the door and does not answer the phone. This was very unlike Patrick, so the father immediately got worried, but since he was at work at that moment and could not go to pick up the order and at the same time to check if everything was all right with his son, Max decided to ask his future daughter-in-law. He called Jessica and with anxiety in his voice said that he couldn't reach his son. Jessica herself had been trying to contact her fiancé since morning, but he didn't answer messages and calls. When she mentioned this to Patrick's father, Max pronounced, Something must have happened to Patrick. Jessica immediately dropped everything she was doing and headed to the groom's house as fast as she could. When she pulled up, she immediately saw Patrick's car in the driveway, which indicated that he hadn't gone anywhere. Since she had her own key, Jessica entered the yard and called out loudly to her lover several times, but there was no response. Jessica carefully opened the front door and saw a horrifying picture. Her fiancé was lying practically at the entrance, in a pool of his own blood. He showed no signs of life. Jessica immediately rushed to call the emergency services, but the paramedics who arrived on the scene were unable to help Patrick and only declared him dead. By the time the police arrived, a distraught Jessica was sobbing in the backyard of the house where Patrick had proposed two months earlier. When one of the officers approached her, she only looked at him and told him she knew who had massacred her lover and ruined her entire life. A rich and powerful ex-boyfriend. To understand this difficult case and to understand who could want to kill a young guy who at first glance had neither enemies nor ill-wishers, you need to go back a little bit at the time when he and Jessica just met. The thing is that, at that time, the girl was in a relationship with a certain Gregory Bender, a wealthy businessman who owned his own investment fund. Jessica met Gregory in her student years. He was 20 years older than her, and he literally turned the young beauty's head. 
the businessman wooed her beautifully, gave her expensive gifts, and took her to fancy resorts. Jessica thought she had found her one and only love, but soon she began to notice some oddities in his behavior. Gregory sought to control his girlfriend in everything, closely watched where she goes, and with whom she communicates. If Jessica had an admirer, he immediately got rid of him through threats and intimidation. At the same time, he told her almost nothing about himself. This relationship lasted almost eight years, and during this time, Gregory never introduced his chosen one to his family or friends. They met, spent time together, or went on vacation only when he wanted it, and Gregory rarely invited his girlfriend to his house. He himself argued that he was very busy. Naturally, Jessica wanted to have a normal family, to have children, but Bender said every time that it was not yet time for that. And when she tried to break off the relationship, Gregory gave her a ring and asked her to marry him. Jessica accepted, but nothing had changed. They still lived apart and saw each other only when the groom said so. One day, Gregory was in a car accident and ended up in a hospital bed. When Jessica heard about it, she rushed to him, but beforehand she decided to stop by his house to get some things for Gregory. There, Jessica ran into a woman she had never seen before and asked who she was. The stranger, instead of answering, asked her a similar question. Jessica showed the ring on her finger and said that she was the bride of the owner of the house. The woman then laughed and showed her her ring, stating that she was Bender's legal wife, Demora Sanchez Bender. After such a shocking revelation, Jessica decided to immediately part ways with the businessman who had cheated her for so many years. However, the boyfriend began to literally pursue Jessica, begging her to return, promising that he would divorce Daimora in the near future, and then they could get married. She once again believed this man, but time passed, and nothing in their relationship did not change. Finally tired of this affair, Jessica filled out a questionnaire on a dating site, where she soon met Patrick. After starting to communicate with him, she firmly decided to break up with Gregory, about which she informed him, but he did not want to let her go. Obsessive Stalker At first, Bender simply persuaded Jessica to come back to him and try to start over, once again promising to divorce his wife. Then he moved on to threats and harassment, and when he realized that all this is useless, decided to search for a rival, about which at that time exactly knew nothing. He had to turn to professionals to hack into Jessica's account and find out who she was communicating with. After finding out who Patrick was and obtaining his contacts, Gregory began sending him threatening messages and demanding that he break up with Jessica, calling her his fiance. Patrick did not react to the threats and was absolutely calm, believing that the matter would not go further than threats. But Jessica was scared because she realized that her ex-boyfriend could expect anything from her. He was a man with a lot of money and connections, and he had a huge collection of firearms that he could use. Jessica offered Patrick to break up before anyone got hurt, but he wouldn't even hear of it. Then they decided to go to the police, providing evidence that Bender was stalking and threatening them. The couple managed to get a restraining order for Gregory to approach them and try to make contact by any means. Gregory was also required to surrender all firearms stored in his home. Things calmed down for a while, and the lovers began to think that the stalker had left them alone. However, Jessica convinced Patrick that it was necessary to install CCTV cameras around and inside the house because she feared that Gregory might violate the ban. A crime scene inspection, and the first theory. But let's go back to the tragic events of February 27, 2018. During the initial examination of the crime scene, Criminalist immediately ruled out the version of robbery and noted that, judging by the nature of the mutilation, this murder had a personal motive, and the perpetrator literally hated his victim. On the body of a 25-year-old guy counted four gunshot wounds, in the thigh, in the chest, and two in the head. In addition, the experts found injuries and bruises characteristic of a fall from a ladder. The body itself was lying on the floor between the front door and the stairs leading to the second floor. Investigators speculated that the killer had most likely snuck into the house and was waiting for the owner on the second floor. When an unsuspecting Patrick went inside and climbed the stairs, the intruder stepped out to meet him and fired the first bullet into his thigh. The wounded young man rolled down the stairs, 
and the perpetrator followed him down, fired another bullet into his chest, and then finished the victim off with two follow-up shots to the head. The murder weapon was not found, but it was a rather rare model of pistol, which was not easy to obtain. The first shell casing was found on the second floor of the house. Two more similar shell casings were found downstairs, but the fourth shell casing was not there, so it was assumed that the perpetrator took it away with him, perhaps as a trophy. Despite Jessica's words that she knows who killed her fiancé, the first under suspicion was the neighbor of the murdered man, with whom they had a serious conflict a couple of months ago. The man was a combat participant and a veteran of the U.S. Army, was wounded and severely concussed in the war, against which he developed a mental disorder. He was excellent with firearms and could easily get a rare model of gun. In December 2017, the veteran mistook his new neighbor for a burglar and opened fire. Luckily, no one was hurt at the time, but the neighbor was hospitalized in a psychiatric hospital due to an exacerbation of his disorder. After he returned home, he constantly followed Patrick, called him a spy, and promised to bring him out in the open. The mentally ill neighbor could indeed have a motive created by his unhealthy imagination, so the man was detained and decided to interrogate. He made no secret of his intense dislike for Patrick, but at the time of the murder itself, he had a 100% alibi, which was confirmed by several people. Searching for evidence and trying to provoke the perpetrator. So, the version of the robbery from the very beginning cancelled, because in the house everything was in its place and the money and valuables remained untouched. Only hard disks with recordings made by video surveillance cameras were missing, so it was impossible to trace who entered and left the house that day. In addition, no evidence at all was found at the crime scene. Forensic experts could not find a single fingerprint, shoe print, or DNA trace. The murder was carefully thought out and planned, and although the investigation had little doubt that Gregory was behind it all, it seemed at the time that he could get away with it. The police decided to go on the sly and asked Jessica to call her former lover and bring him to a frank conversation. Jessica agreed without hesitation. She dialed Bender's number and made a spectacle of herself. She blamed him for what had happened, cried, and kept asking why he'd done it. But Gregory seemed to have figured out what the investigators were up to from the start, and persisted in pretending he didn't understand. When Jessica said that he killed her fiancé, the businessman pretended to be surprised by this news, and after expressed his condolences to the ex-girlfriend. To get Gregory to confess, to make him mad, or to force him to commit a blunder, never succeeded. The police had no reason to detain or question the man, he could only be called to testify, but he honored the restraining order and seemed to have let the ex-girlfriend go long ago. The Killer's Notes While the investigation was treading water, trying to find any clues, the police received a call from Daimora Sanchez Bender, saying that she had important information about the Patrick de la Cerda case. The woman was immediately invited to the station for an interview where she said that shortly before the crime, she saw a strange notebook on her husband's desk in his office. Looking into it, Demora found a detailed plan of some stranger's house, and next to it, there was a strange algorithm of actions. She hadn't paid any attention to it at the time, but when Demora saw a news report about the brutal murder of a young man, and the story showed the plan of his house, she immediately remembered the sketches of her unfaithful husband, with whom she was on the verge of divorce, and decided to tell the investigators. This information gave the police enough reason to search the house of the alleged perpetrator. The mysterious notebook, about which the wife of the businessman spoke, was found in the office, but the pages with the plan of the house and other records were removed. However, they were soon found in the office, but in a trash can that Gregory had apparently failed or forgotten to empty. He had simply ripped out the pages, crumpled them up, and tossed them in the trash. Apparently, he was confident that his house would not be searched, since there was no evidence against him. On the sheets of paper, in addition to the layout of the house, there was a detailed plan of the crime itself. It became clear that the criminal had prepared long and thoroughly, working out every point. In particular, it was said about the need to turn off the phone, use gloves and lubricate the soles of shoes with a special compound so that it did not leave traces on the floor. From the records, it became clear that Gregory followed his victim, knew what time Patrick returned home, 
and was aware of the presence of surveillance cameras in the house and yard. In addition, Gregory made sure to dispose of the crime weapon, dirty clothes, shoes, and gloves. He was only let down by the fact that his own records had not been destroyed in time and his wife's curiosity. In addition, a fourth missing shell casing was found on the table, in a cigar box, which the gunman was supposed to have carried off as a trophy. Forensics confirmed that it was the exact same shell casing from the crime scene. The trial and the defense attorney's attempts to shift the blame to Jessica, the evidence was enough to arrest Gregory and initiate a trial. But the main problem was that all the evidence found could be called circumstantial because the crime weapon was never found. There was no evidence that the accused had ever been to the victim's house, and there were no witnesses. Bender's trial did not begin until May 2021, more than three years after his atrocity. During this time, he hired the best lawyers who had time to thoroughly prepare for the case. The businessman was optimistic and seemed to believe that he would get away with it. Jessica was a key witness. She detailed her relationship with Gregory over many years, how she learned he was married and tried to break up with him, as well as the harassment and threats he made against her and Patrick. As evidence, she provided saved screenshots of correspondence as well as phone records. In response, Bender's attorneys attempted to shift all the blame onto Jessica. The defense stated that Jessica herself provoked Gregory with her behavior because she registered on a dating site and started a new relationship, not yet broken up with Gregory, which hurt his pride and ego. Also, Jessica was accused of mercantilism, noting that she liked to receive expensive gifts from a rich suitor. The main evidence, sheets with records of the murder plan, the lawyers called only a fantasy of a wounded man who wanted to take revenge on his rival. At the same time, the defense insisted that the defendant did not go further than plans and fantasies, so his traces of the scene of the crime were not found. In addition, according to the lawyers, the search in the house of their client was illegal and was conducted with violations, and therefore the second evidence, a shell casing, he could simply plant it in the process. The crime weapon was also not found, and the model of the gun Jessica identified from a picture, saying that she had previously seen it in the collection of her boyfriend. But she could be wrong, because she was not well-versed in weapons. Ex-wife testimony and final judgment. At one of the sessions, the defendant's now ex-wife, Dimora Sanchez, was called as a witness. The man, who had hitherto looked indifferent, suddenly became animated and unexpectedly confessed his love for her. The ex-wife was moved by this confession and apparently changed her mind about testifying against Gregory. She confused her testimony, citing her forgetfulness, and finally added that she had lived with the man for many years and doubted that he was capable of murder. Despite attempts by defense attorneys to challenge the legality of the search of the defendant's home, despite his ex-wife's unexpected statement, and despite the lack of direct evidence, the jury, after hours of deliberation, still found Gregory Bender guilty of first-degree murder. He was sentenced to life imprisonment, barring him from ever being eligible for parole. As the judge read out the sentence, the defendant stared at Jessica intently, seemingly without even blinking. He was literally glaring at her, which made her feel sick and almost had a panic attack. She sat next to her late fiancé's mother and at one point began sobbing and literally choking. Despite numerous attempts by Bender and his highly paid lawyers to appeal the verdict and get the case reviewed, all of their appeals were rejected. Not the least role in this played a wide resonance of the case in society, because a wealthy millionaire businessman in cold blood massacred a simple working man and tried to get away with it. The story of Patrick de la Cerda was widely covered in the press. With Gregory Bender still behind bars at the moment, Jessica Devnani says she feels safe and continues to live for Patrick and keep his memory alive. She wears the ring he gave her as a gift, as well as that exclusive piece of jewelry Patrick never got around to giving her. Jessica maintains a close relationship with her deceased fiancé's parents, who treat her like their own daughter. Today, we're going to visit Indianapolis. It is a blend of modernity and original origins, ancient traditions, and advanced technology. Indianapolis boasts art museums that showcase examples of cultural achievements from past centuries and modern times. 
Indianapolis hosts many festivals and events each year, with the Indy 500 automobile race being the most popular. But in our story, the tranquil Indianapolis that was to become for the Blackburn family a center of peace and God's home on earth, became the site of a violent tragedy. On the morning of November 10, 2015, a car parked outside a home on Sunnyfield Court. Davy Blackburn had returned from his daily workout at the gym. He was about to get out of the car, but a phone call kept him in the vehicle for a few minutes. After finishing the call, he leisurely got out of the car and went into the house. When he opened the door, he froze and the gym bag fell out of his hands. His wife was lying on the living room floor in a pool of blood. Davy was confused and badly shocked. He rushed to his beloved, gave her a cursory examination, felt for a pulse and urgently dialed the emergency phone number. The young woman was alive. In the living room where the tragedy occurred was a complete mess. Things were scattered. The purse of the unfortunate was emptied. On the second floor of the house, a small child was crying. Emergency services arrived at the house after eight minutes. The area was cordoned off. The house was filled with police officers and investigators. The victim was rushed to the hospital. She turned out to be 28-year-old Amanda Blackburn. But let's start in order not to miss any important details of this tragic story. Amanda Grace Byers was born on July 31, 1987 in Muskegon, Michigan. She attended school in Indianapolis, Indiana, but the family moved to Elkhart in 1995. There, Amanda graduated from Elkhart Christian Academy in 2006, and as early as 2008, she graduated from Pensacola Christian College in Pensacola, Florida with an associate's degree. Amanda grew up in a deeply religious family where Christianity and the power of God's Word were paramount. Amanda's father was the lead pastor of First Baptist Church in Elkhart, Indiana. The religious traditions of the church, sermons, and psalter the girl knew from childhood by heart and honored them unconditionally. When other children were in a hurry to grow up to know the taste of adult life, to go to parties and fall in love, Amanda loved Jesus and dreamed of serving him. But God already loved his Amanda. After all, he had created her in the likeness of an angel a blonde-haired, slender girl with an open, kind smile and sincere intentions. But not only the girl's appearance was perfect, her thoughts and heart were also virgin, in every act of a man that was love for her neighbor. As a teenager, Amanda took a vow of chastity and agreed not to even kiss a man until she was married, and she was always true to her word. But the girl's heart beat harder when she met her true and only love. It turned out to be Davy Blackburn, he was a native of Tuscaloosa, Alabama. The guy studied religion at Southern Wesleyan University and was also from a Christian and believing family. Davy and Amanda met on a blind date at a Hawk Nelson Christian band concert organized by her sister and Davy's best friend. At that time, they were studying in different colleges, but every vacation the lovers spent together. It was pure platonic love, devoid of earthly lusts. They took walks together, shared their innermost thoughts and favorite excerpts from church books. They were never bored, for they knew how to rejoice in small things, and sincerely joked with each other. Once, before returning to school, Davy and Amanda had a mock milkshake drinking contest, which Amanda lost. Davy then jokingly called Amanda a milk girl. Looking at her, he realized he had met the girl he wanted to marry. The couple dated long distance for a long time. They were constantly messaging each other on messengers, called each other and chatted for hours, every vacation they spent together. They were so reverent and tender about a serious relationship between a man and a woman that they visited a psychologist for a long time to learn how to communicate properly. On August 1st, 2008, the marriage ceremony of Amanda and Davy Blackburn took place. After the wedding, Davy told friends that from the moment he kissed Amanda, he knew that because of God's plan, there would be a special bond between them. For the first four years after the wedding, the Blackburns lived in South Carolina. Davy was an associate pastor at New Spring Church under Pastor Perry Noble, but the young man wanted more. 
and he suggested to Amanda that she move to Indianapolis to organize a new church for youth. Davy worked as a youth pastor, production director, and assistant campus pastor. Amanda was reluctant to leave her family and part with her loved ones, and for a while struggled with the need to leave South Carolina. But she finally relented after her husband told her that God must have big things in store for them. In 2012, the Blackbournes moved from South Carolina to Indianapolis to plant an independent, high-profile church in the North Side. The religious organization started by the young family was geared toward young people, as is made clear in the weekly videos the couple posted on their website about relationship advice, conflict resolution, and what the Bible says about intimate relationships. In 2014, the family had their firstborn child, Weston Blackburn. The family was perfectly happy. They had a comfortable home on a quiet street, a favorite job in the church, which was regularly attended by a large number of young people. Their sermons were listened to and believed in. They lived in perfect harmony and understanding. But the day of November 10th, 2015, changed the family's life once and for all. Ambulance crews arrived at the Blackburn residence in the 2800 block of Sunnyfield Court around 8.30 a.m. The ambulance crews arrived at the Blackburn residence. The pregnant young woman was rushed to the hospital where she was hooked up to a ventilator and underwent a series of resuscitative measures. But sadly, Amanda died the next day, along with her unborn baby. As it turned out, the family was expecting a baby girl who was named Evie Grace at her burial. Her death sparked a lot of sympathy and prayers on social media for an extended period of time as friends, family members, and strangers mourned Amanda with public posts. On November 11th, the day Amanda was officially declared dead, Davy released an official statement saying that Amanda made it her life's calling to love and serve everyone she knew. She made it her life's mission to know Jesus as her personal savior to multitudes. Through her death and legacy, more people will come to a saving faith in Christ. I know without a shadow of a doubt that she wants me to continue what we started here in Indy. I firmly believe that God is still good, that he is taking our tragedy and turning it into triumph, and that the best is indeed yet to come. Dave wrote, The murder of the pregnant woman was a blow not only to the entire Orthodox family, but also a shock to the entire state. People demanded that the perpetrator of Amanda and her unborn child be found and punished. In his first interview under oath, Davy Blackburn said he found his wife Amanda injured and unconscious on the living room floor. She was partially naked, with her underwear lying nearby, herself lying on the floor in a pool of blood face down. The pastor told investigators that he left the house around 6 a.m. to go to the fitness center to work out. When he left, he left the door unlocked. You always do that too, don't you? You leave and don't lock the door? He told investigators. It's hard to say whether the criminals would have stopped if Davy had still used the key, but it's pretty obvious that they wouldn't have entered the house so easily, and Amanda had precious time to contact emergency services. But that didn't happen, and the attack left Amanda with three gunshot wounds, one of which was to the head. No arrests were made in the case. Just days after the crime, police quickly determined that her husband, Davy Blackburn, was not involved in the horrific incident. However, in the trial transcripts, Davy Blackburn's testimony is supplemented by the testimony of the first emergency medical paramedic from the Indianapolis Fire Department, Scott Floyd, who arrived at the home after Davy's 911 call. He said Davy Blackburn was outside at the end of the driveway with bloody hands when they arrived at the house. Scott stated that Davy was very calm at the time. According to Scott, Davy did not understand what had happened to his wife, Amanda. He maintained that she was lying on the floor and he could not wake her up. Davy claimed that he came home from the gym at about 7.30 a.m. and continued his phone call with his friend Kenneth Wagner in the driveway, occasionally getting out, strolling down the driveway and peeking through the front door window to see if baby Weston was awake. He said he finished his call, entered his home at 8.10 a.m. and found Amanda lying face down on the floor. He thought she was sick or unconscious. 
He called emergency services at 8.22 a.m. It took him 12 minutes to make the call. In an emergency situation, 12 minutes is a long time. He repeatedly said he just thought something had gone wrong with the pregnancy, that maybe his wife had gotten dizzy and fell. Did he not notice after 12 minutes that there was brain matter about five feet away from her body? Emergency room Dr. Scott Floyd testified that the blood on her head was coagulated, leaving him to believe that the gunshot to her head had occurred about a couple hours earlier, but those transcripts were not made public. Davey was asked if he had called anyone else. He said that after he called 911, he called his father. Defense attorneys did not cross-examine Davey Blackburn. Authorities corroborated his story with surveillance footage from the gym, and he was not among the suspects. An autopsy conducted November 12th showed the woman suffered a gunshot wound to the back of her head. She also had a gunshot wound to the lower left arm that went to her biceps, and a through and through gunshot wound that went in and out of her upper back. There were also multiple scratches on the left cheek, a split lip, and a knocked out lower tooth. The above injuries indicated a possible struggle between Amanda and her attacker. A thorough investigation was launched. CCTV footage from nearby streets was examined, and neighbors and family acquaintances were interviewed. For example, a neighbor reported hearing gunshots about 35 minutes after Davy left the house. Another neighbor, Reginald Townsell, said their street was not the type of neighborhood where a shooting could occur and that the Blackburns didn't deserve this. The neighbors were shocked, as everyone thought the Blackburn family were wonderful and truly loving people. Based on Amanda's injuries and the missing bank cards and MacBook bag, the initial theory was robbery. During the investigation, police determined that on the morning of November 10th, 2015, several emergency calls were made reporting a home invasion at separate homes near Blackburn's home. Around 5.20 a.m., one woman reported waking up to find her cell phone, laptop, purse, and keys missing from her apartment. Her car was also gone from the parking lot. The sliding glass door to her apartment was open, she said. Three hours later, another woman reported a burglary at a home on Sunnyfield Court. Someone broke through the patio screen and got inside. According to police, four televisions, a MacBook Pro, a Tiffany Pearl necklace, a pink women's sweater, a remote control, a bag of oranges and bedding were missing from the home. Five minutes after that, Someone else from Sunnyfield Court called the emergency services. It was Davy Blackburn. Lieutenant Richard Riedel of the Indianapolis Police Department said police are looking for a connection between the homicide and other burglaries that occurred in the same neighborhood in the morning. Police have not released details about the investigation honoring the secrecy of the investigation, but after getting hold of images of possible suspects from one of the burglarized homes, they released them asking the public to identify and help the investigation. Davy Blackburn was confident that the police department was doing everything they could to catch his wife's perpetrator. Investigators assured that they had never seen such part of Blanche given to them to continue the investigation, so they were confident that very soon some of these promising leads would help find a person or persons responsible. The key clues used to track down the three suspects were a stolen pink sweater, cell phone records, and an ATM receipt. The receipt and sweater were found in the stolen Chrysler Sebring, which was used during the robberies. Authorities recovered the vehicle November 11th near the Blackburn's home. The debit card listed on the receipt matched the stolen card of Amanda Blackburn. Investigators obtained a warrant to examine the ATM camera and found video showing the driver covering his face with a stolen pink sweater. Police relied on DNA testing, surveillance footage, and witnesses to identify the suspects. DNA testing from the sweater confirmed that Jalen Watson was one of the suspects. Watson's identification was the first major breakthrough in the case. The affidavit said cell phone records were obtained because Watson's number was in the database because of his parole for another burglary. Diana Gordon's cell phone records were also obtained. These records showed that Watson's and Gordon's cell phones were in the area when the crime was committed. The phone records also indicated that Gordon and Watson were near the Chase Bank where Amanda's debit card was used on the day of the murder. 
Larry Taylor was the final piece of the puzzle. By examining surveillance footage in the area, police were able to identify Taylor's phone number and trace his address. In the days that followed, reports also surfaced that a gun had been found near the Blackburn home. Police said a man delivered the gun to the Broad Ripple Fire Department, claiming to have found it outside the couple's home. The gun was analyzed by crime lab technicians. After two weeks of investigation and detective work, police charged 18-year-old Larry Taylor and 21-year-old Jalen Watson with the murder of Amanda Blackburn. A third burglary suspect, 24-year-old Diana Gordon, was arrested for a parole violation, but was not charged with a felony because he did not enter the Blackburn home. After receiving crime lab results, a gun found near the victim's home was proven to be the weapon of the crime. All three assailants were apprehended. When questioned, Larry Taylor said that he shot the woman twice somewhere because she jumped on him and he didn't want her to scratch him. Then, when she fell, he leaned over her body and shot her in the back of the head and bent over her watching her bleed to death. A criminal trio came to rob the Blackburn house. They just wanted some money. So they headed to the Blackburn home, where the husband had left the front door unlocked when he left for the gym. Inside, they confronted Amanda to keep her out of the way. Taylor hit her with a gun. Watson and Gordon saw the woman and wanted to leave. They already had the bank cards they had stolen earlier, so they went looking for an ATM. They tried unsuccessfully to get $500 from one ATM, but got $400 from another. This is where they got caught on CCTV. They then drove back to the Blackburn house to pick up Taylor. In their absence, a struggle ensued in the house. Amanda came to her senses after being hit and lunged at the perpetrator, at which point he tackled the woman. Afterward, Taylor put the stolen debit cards in the car of accomplices, who had gone to an ATM at the time of the crime, and when they returned, he admitted to shooting Amanda. According to court documents, the Blackburn home was the third target of the November 10th attack by Taylor, Watson, and Gordon. In the first break-in, the thieves stole a laptop, wallet, and car while the resident was asleep. While inside the home, they discovered they were being recorded by a video camera, but simply moved on. The group drove up to another home, broke in through a patio window, and stole four televisions, a laptop, jewelry, a bag of oranges, and a pink sweater that eventually helped police identify them the affidavit said. Court documents outlined the evidence police collected against the suspects. The most important piece of evidence. Watson's DNA was found on a pink sweater taken during the second burglary, which was then used to cover his face from a surveillance camera as he tried to withdraw cash using Amanda Blackburn's bank card. Watson and Gordon cooperated with the investigation in return for a reduced sentence. Larry Taylor waived his right to remain silent and admitted to being near the scene of the burglary. He said he may have stopped in the Blackburn neighborhood, but claimed he was so confused he couldn't remember. Formal charges were filed by the county prosecutor. Larry Taylor faces 13 charges, including the very same felony, after knowingly and willfully killing Amanda Blackburn. Jalen Watson is charged with a felony. Both he and Taylor face multiple charges of burglary, robbery, and theft. Diana Gordon, who was in custody due to a parole violation, also faces burglary charges. There was a fourth person who knew about the robberies, burglaries, and other crimes, but did not participate in them. He was questioned and released. The Indianapolis Metropolitan Police Department's Violent Crimes Unit worked with the gang unit and federal marshals to arrest Taylor. Police Chief Rick Height praised the cooperation that led to the arrest. The detectives worked tirelessly, all day long without sleep, to solve the murders in the city. With the assistance of Assistant U.S. Attorney Josh Minkler and Prosecutor Terry Curry, justice was served. Because the victim was pregnant, prosecutors said they would consider filing additional charges related to the fetus. Even though the woman's underwear was removed and her shirt was pulled up, they said there was no evidence to support the rape charges. Larry Taylor's first trial took place in December 2021, but the trial was over in seconds when it was discovered that one of the jurors had shared information about the case with other jurors. The disclosure interrupted the trial. 
a mistrial was declared. The final trial was held in October 2022. Subsequent jury selection was more thorough. The county drew more than 100 people as possible jurors. Each had to fill out a 16-page questionnaire so attorneys could assess whether they could reach a fair verdict. Larry Joe Taylor was sentenced to 86 years in the Indiana State Correctional Institution for the murder of Amanda Blackburn and for additional charges related to a burglary from a home. Diana Gordon and Jalen Watson agreed to plea agreements and testified against Larry Taylor at trial. Both received sentences ranging from 20 to 35 years in prison. Jalen Watson and Larry Taylor are currently incarcerated in the Marion County Jail. A murder conviction in Indiana can send a person to prison for 45 to 60 years, and some are punishable by life in prison or the death penalty. Prosecutors filed a motion to enhance Larry Taylor's sentence, which means he could face an additional 20 years in prison because Amanda Blackburn was pregnant when he allegedly massacred her. Davy Blackburn, the church's pastor, said he is relieved that those responsible for killing his wife have been caught and will not be able to harm anyone else. Amanda Blackburn's death has resonated with thousands of people, including the state's chief executive, her funeral at a Christian church was attended by more than 2,000 people. Among them was Governor Mike Pence. Resonant Church has set up a donation page to help pay for Amanda Blackburn's funeral and medical expenses. Davy Blackburn said he is hopeful, hopeful for a judicial system that will certainly show wisdom to the people who have caused his family so much pain. Incredibly, he has repeatedly reported that he has decided to forgive Amanda's killers. I was very relieved to learn of the arrest, he told reporters. Although everything inside me wants to hate, be angry and despair, I choose the path of forgiveness, grace, and hope. Amanda Blackburn's case has generated significant interest across the country, with coverage appearing in national and international media. Davy Blackburn changed his role from that of an unhappy husband to that of a popular blogger, he began to capitalize on his tragedy and record multiple podcasts and videos, which he called Nothing Wasted. He began appearing on TV stations and speaking out about his wife's death, repeating over and over the pain he had experienced and recounting the tragedy. But he didn't seem unhappy. Amanda's death made Davy not only famous, but rich. The fact that he received an insurance payout after his wife's death does suggest that he didn't accidentally forget to lock the door that day on November 10th, 2015. Didn't he? What do you guys think? On March 2nd, 2016, Davy Blackburn bought a new five-bedroom, four-bathroom home with a pool. He then sold the very house where Amanda was murdered. For an unhappy husband who lost his beloved, Davy was pretty happy. In July 2016, he posted a photo of his new home on his blog and captioned it, How happy I am to have pool parties in my new home. Now Davy Blackburn is happy in his new marriage. Nothing is wasted serendipity. Turn your eyes to Jesus, gaze upon his marvelous countenance, and earthly things become strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace.